Welcome everyone. Good morning here from Washington, D.C. Um, we have a full room here of scientists and speakers ready to go for this fantastic workshop. And my name is Andrea Baccarelli. I'm a professor of environmental health sciences at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. And I had the great pleasure to, to serve as one of the two co-chairs with uh, Kristen Malecki of the Standing Committee on the Use of Emerging Science for Environmental Health Decisions. So I would like to introduce first what the committee does and then uh, give you an overview of our two days together for this workshop. And uh, of course, I mean, uh, the National Academy of Science, uh, the National Academy Standing Committee on the Use of Emerging Science for Environmental Health Decisions, short ESEHD, as I'll use to say from now on, examines and discusses issues on the use of new science, tools, and research for environmental health decisions. Uh, we convene workshops uh, that provide a public venue for communications, for discussion, for brainstorming new ideas, and uh, for government, industry, scientists, environmental groups, and the academic community. We want to propose uh, topics that are around scientific discoveries and advances in methods and approaches that can be used in the identification, quantification, and control of environmental impacts on human health. The committee is organized under the auspices of the Board of Life Sciences and the Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and sponsored by the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences. And of course, I mean, uh, this is all about the people. We have an amazing committee here that you see on screen uh, that is uh, co-chaired by, as I mentioned, by Kristen Marecki and I. And uh, I would love for all of you to be in the room when we meet about and hear all the amazing ideas and uh, proposals that we, you can uh, uh, listen to being there. It's really an, a very proactive and very diverse and very enthusiastic group, and of course, very qualified. I We also work with a multi-agency group of federal government uh, liaisons who, along with the standing committee members, help shape and guide our activities. And um, here on this uh, slide, you see some of the topics we have covered in the past few years. Uh, since uh, 2019, we have hosted numerous workshops on a wide range of topics. And depending on the maturity of the field, um, the topics can be broadly categorized as uh, emerging research strategies and analytic methodologies, emerging areas of co convergence, and emergence advances in uh, science and technology. And the good news is that uh, many of us missed these workshops in the past, but we have uh, proceedings online, notes, some videos as well. So please uh, uh, look us up on Google and you will find uh, the committee, pro the proceedings of the workshop over there. It's a very rich repository. Um, as I said, this is really about the people, sorry, this stopped working. Okay, got back online. Uh, this is really about the people and uh, that includes, of course, you. So if you have ideas about workshops that we want to consider, please email us. There is this email on the screen and you send us any idea about workshops we should do in the future. We are organizing new ones and we look for new ideas. And um, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, I encourage all of us to be active participants. We are in this new brave world where some of us are in the room and most of you are online. So we want everyone to be active, everyone to participate and contribute. And um, please uh, use the, the chat box or the comment box online to submit your comments and questions. And um, of course, uh, uh, and for those of us in here in person, we have microphone, remember to, to bring them up and to take them, take them down if uh, and to and to switch them off when you are done. And we lost the video here. The fortunately I'm almost done. I don't need the slides really, but um 
Uh, what I would like to say is that also thoughts and ideas shared during this workshop, considering this workshop is public, are really attributed to individuals and not to the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. And uh, lastly, recordings of the workshop will be available. So if you missed uh, the workshop today or you missed any part of the workshop, please come back to the website. You will be able to stream them at your own convenience. And at this point, I would like to start to introduce our two days together. Uh, the title of the workshop is Advances in Multimodal Artificial Intelligence to Enhance Environmental and Biomedical Data Integration. And of course, I mean, uh, we are all here in person or online because we are excited. So I really don't need to give you much about why we this is particularly important. But uh, all of us know, and uh, everyone who knows me know that I'm over enthusiastic about this. So someone will have to slow me down during these two days. But but the really everything from uh, online searches to to chat GPT seems to be powered by AI today. And uh, and clearly it is ubiquitous, it has become very much part of our lives. And um, this workshop will consider what uh, artificial intelligence and related techniques mean for environmental health, for biomedicine, and for health. And of course, uh, we would like to thank the planning committee for organizing this workshop and give a big round of applause for their hard work and makes this workshop uh, that we're all participating possible. And the planning committee includes Carmen Marcet, as a chair from Emory, who is here in the room. Uh, Yao Ye Chung from the University of Minnesota. Thank you. Uh, Christopher Duncan from the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences. Uh, Anindita Dutta from the University of Chicago. And uh, Megan Latshaw from Johns Hopkins and Gwen Ellen Ottinger from Drexel University. Although I had the smallest slide ever seen by humanity, I've been able to read them, but uh, and, uh, I don't need an eye an test, not yet. So, and um, I'll give you just a quick snapshot of the next two days. Um, as I mentioned, we will hear from experts, speakers, and panelists who are trailblazers in the field, who had done new advances and have substantial experience in this area. We want to hear what they're learning, what they're doing, and where these still need to go. Uh, we will wrap up the first day with a keynote address by Eric Topol and a chat with both Eric Topol and Rick Wojciech. Then please join us again tomorrow, 10 a.m. as the same as today, for an equally exciting lineup of speakers. Uh, the agenda is online and you can access it online and download it for your own convenience. I'm sure it's going to be innovative. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be helpful. It's, our workshops, and this is no exception, intend to be stimulating, intend to be novel. We want to be a venue also in which new ideas can be generated and where new collaborations can be made and new areas can be brought forward. With that, I would like to turn it over for session one to Megan Latshaw. Thank you, Megan. All right, welcome everybody. We're excited to, to kick this off with the first session, which is meant to sort of be a level setting session. And um, I guess I should start off by introducing myself. As Andrea said, I'm Megan Latchall. I work at Johns Hopkins University in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering. Um, and uh, as you'll probably see throughout uh, one of my um, longest stints in my career was here in DC when I worked for the Association of Public Health Laboratories and also the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. So I have a very practice-oriented approach um, to environmental health. And also um, I served as the chair of the APHA environment section 
Um, and so uh, that's a general summary of who I am. So to this session, what we're going to be focusing on is uh, what are the foundations and challenges to using AI to integrate environmental health and biomedical data. Um, and so we're going to lay out the current state of research when it comes to environmental health, when it comes to biomedical science, and when it comes to AI. So we'll all sort of have a sense of where things stand in these three fields. And most importantly, we want you to be thinking throughout this session and throughout this entire workshop about the opportunities for how AI can advance these fields and bring together these two areas. So our first speaker is Dr. Patrick Bricey, and he is a professor of environmental health sciences and medicine at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Bricey recently concluded an eight-year tenure as director of CDC's National Center for Environmental Health, an agency for toxic substances and disease registry. And he earned his MPH and his PhD from Johns Hopkins. Um, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Bricey. Right. I have a single slide. Not sure we're going to get it up or not. Uh, I don't really need it since I'm, I'm uh, I took a minimalist uh, approach to this talk. Uh, and since I'm really just trying to level set, I, I want to start off by by uh, humbly stating that I certainly don't think I have my finger on the pulse of all environmental health research that might be relevant to this. Uh, and, but I'm going to talk about it from one perspective, something I've been thinking about for a while. and and so we've we've heard many statements, things like, you know, place matters. Uh, and so we know that there's many challenges to understanding what we need to know to identify, quantify, and control factors, as we just heard from, from Andrea during his introduction. But I would add one thing to that, humbly, in addition to identifying, uh, quantifying, controlling, but anticipating. And I think that anticipation is probably an important component, especially when it comes to AI. So can I have the next slide? So um, I think the biggest challenges we have and the biggest opportunities we have revolves around access to new data that allow us to look at environmental factors. I'm going to speak on the environmental side. Other panel members will talk about the biomedical side. Understand factors related to the temporal spatial resolution of hazards and risk factors in our environment. I think there's an unprecedented opportunity here. And along with that comes big challenges. So I put a number of things on this slide. I, I could have put dozens of them on the slide. I didn't want to make this a big slide heavy talk, but but we certainly know that in terms of inter internet of things and smart cities, there are things that are happening right now in, in cities that they're collecting data for all sorts of purposes, but usually for how do they manage the city functions, how do they manage the city assets, how do they manage resources and services uh, and to officially pr improve the operation of cities. And uh, the environment is usually not part of those discussions at all, but it absolutely should be. And so we need to make sure we're integrated in all that going forward. So there's lots of examples of things that are happening now, but we can easily see how we can build on those. So, for example, in Baltimore City, I, I read recently they, they, they're they putting uh, noise monitors in certain places of the city to monitor for gunshots and to target police operations for gun violence going forward. So. You know, obviously, noise monitors can be used for a lot more than detecting gun violence going forward. And and I was thinking, as wonder if anybody in the city of Baltimore is talking about, you know, where those things go, what else that data can be used for going forward. And I'm sure there are other cities doing the exact same thing. There are many cities collect electronic water use data to manage uh, water sensing water use, uh, especially you know, in the city of Baltimore, having a drought right now. Uh, there's a water source that has to be tapped when the reservoirs get too low. And so they need to manage that. We need to figure out where the water is going, who's using water. In addition to just how to bill people for their water, they need to manage that. But it's very easy to think we could easily put water quality parameters in that data collection as well. We know, for example, that after the water crisis, that people started developing home lead water sampling detectors in real time. So we have the opportunity to monitor stuff. 
uh, that that we probably need to start thinking about if we're if we're building these systems to manage city functions. Let's see how we can use it for environmental health data. Temperature is a big deal. So we we, we all know that uh, you know heat stress and health effects of extreme heat events is a growing concern in environmental health. And many cities are are measuring temperature around the city, but they're doing it to, to for electric grid management. They're not thinking about how that can be used for health environmental health assessment. So I'm talking now about how do we how do we integrate data streams just from the physical side of things. I haven't even touched on the challenges for the biomedical side of things going forward. Traffic monitoring is another one. Many cities are monitoring traffic. We all know that traffic is being very carefully monitored. So we can access it on our phones every day. Uh, and it is being used for air quality management in the future yeah, as, as we go forward. So, but how do we think about how do we use that data more efficiently? So in addition, there's explosion in opportunities for satellite remote sensing going forward. You see a picture on this graph. So this is a this is a graph of wildfires in Canada affecting the East Coast. Now you might think this was last week. This was in 2002. So this is from a paper that we published at Johns Hopkins looking at the health impacts of wildfires on the East Coast in 2002. So this has been around for a long time, uh, and actually 2012, sorry. And um, so, uh, you know, but that's just an example of one satellite data, but satellite data is being used right now in addition to tracking weather, wildfires, it's, using, it's being used to assess water quality. You can, you can look at the color of the water to assess algal blooms and, and growth of algal blooms going forward. There's all sorts of land use vector quality uh, vector ecology issues that can be assessed with satellite data that might help us understand changes in infectious disease parameters. There's there's measurements of soil mo moisture and drought that can be used. All that have health consequences as well going forward. So obviously there's big uses for climate change extreme weather events. It's being used for that right now. And and you know as as we watch the radio this morning, listen to the news this morning. The, the extreme weather that's about to hit the southeast today is a good example of that. And so we're already using data like this for environmental health, for emergency management and emergency response conditions. Now, I'll put down here sensor technology <clears throat> and something clear, I think, near and dear to David's heart uh, is, you know, there's been an explosion in, in capability of measuring things using small portable sensors. It has huge implications for for data management issues, data quality issues going forward, uh, and has big opportunities for citizen science issues. We need to think about how, to, how do we use citizen science better? And how do we take measurements that people take on themselves better? And so we're now getting in the realm of, of, of what's been called precision environmental health. You know, how do we take measurements that people can take on themselves and how do we use that on an individual basis as well as a population basis, basis to assess health impacts going forward? So a good example of that is, is heat stress. So for example, my colleagues at, at CDC and I published a paper a few years ago that said in, in uh, 2020, I think it was, there was a heat wave in the Northwest. And we, we were able to show that over a four or five day period, there was a 70 fold increase in ED visits from that. Nothing startling about that going forward. But those ED visits don't have to happen. Why do they happen? It's because these are vulnerable people we can use. We can use data sets to identify vulnerabilities, these are people who, who, who don't have access to transportation. We can use data to, to assess that. We know that when we looked at, at why cooling centers aren't being used in another community in the Southwest, we saw that people who need the cooling centers don't know where the cooling centers are and they don't have access to transportation to get there. These are all things once we understand we can fix using data. And how do we make it so that people don't have to go to emergency departments during extreme heat events going forward? So there are many challenges uh, to using these data. Uh, this includes how do, how do we integrate it in a meaningful way, which is part of what we're going to talk about today uh, through this session. You know, and how do we anticipate, I think, when problems, how do we use these data to anticipate when problems are going to occur, not only just to kind of quantify them and address them, and how do we use them to evaluate the effectiveness of whatever control procedures we put in place? Perfect example of that. So we, we, we spent a lot of time doing things that we think are improving people's health and reducing people's exposures, but we don't always evaluate how effective they are. And so there's opportunities for effectiveness research here these days that we have to look at as well. So how do we identify the risks are greater, greatest? How do we prioritize our efforts? This leads us to questions inevitably about environmental justice issues, uh, because you know oftentimes we, if we address where the exposures are greater, 
that's where we're looking at disadvantaged communities because that's where the exposures and the health risks are greatest as well. So, so these are there's a challenges here associated with using uh, these data to address environmental health that inevitably leads us to addressing environmental justice issues as well. So I'm, I'll just end right there and I'll say these are exciting times. Uh, there are many challenges. We need to start training people to utilize data like this. Our training needs to include more data science assessment in, in the environmental health scientists we trade. We need to think about how do we use these data, how do we take advantage of them, how do we address the quality issues associated with the data we collect, and how do we make decisions about it. But I'm very excited about what these opportunities hold. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Bricey. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Lucilla Ono Machado, uh, who's the Deputy Dean for Biomedical Informatics and the Chair of Biomedical Informatics um, and Data Science at the Yale School of Medicine. Her research focuses on privacy for healthcare and biomedical sciences. Before that, she was Associate Dean um, for informatics and technology and the founding chair of the UCSD Health Department of um, Biomedical Informatics. Also, she's the PI for the California Precision Medicine Consortium for the NIH All of Us Research um, Program. And she received her medical degree from University of Sao Paulo and her doctoral degree in medical information sciences and computer science from Stanford. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Ono Machado. Oh, hi. Thank you so much for the organizers and, and for the facilitator here. Uh, I would like to share my slides now. I think I need to be granted permission by the host. So I, I still cannot. Okay. I'm you have sorry. permission. Um, somehow it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, now I got it. Thank you. And please let me know if I have the correct mode or I need to swap this place. And we see the notes. So I think you might have swapped this place. Yeah. 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 So thank you so much. Um, I'll briefly comment on precision medicine and the role of um, AI, environmental health and biomedicine. And again, this will be a very overview of some things that we are doing in, in colleagues in various projects. So to enhance health and healthcare using data, we definitely need new algorithms, tools, and systems that use informatics and data science, uh, AI, statistical learning, and so on, uh, to enable the personalized health, the personalized medicine uh, via uh, harmonizing and integrating data from several modalities, including electronic health records, EHRs, human genomes, microbiomes, uh, evidently environmental data that we're talking about today, uh, surveys, and so on. And then we build predictive models that can be used at the individual level. Most uh, importantly, we also not only characterize, but use that information to help mitigate inequities in health and healthcare. So this circle here is just to um, illustrate some of the subspecialties in data science that are involved in terms of improving human health. We obviously won't talk about them all, but you can see that several types of data and specialties revolve around those uh, data types. Uh, and in a particular interest today is sensor data, environmental data, and integration with electronic health records and um, omics data in, in other uh, modalities. So I'll talk primarily about models, uh, but keep in mind that uh, you know the, the data cohort studies are super important. I'll speak a little bit about that. And then the implementation aspect is um, something that we, we totally need to work more on the science of implementation to get uh, our discoveries and findings disseminated in practice. So precision care and health 
I, I spoke about uh, we have in genomic data for variant-based therapy and cancer and I, I, HIV treatments and so on. On phenotypic data, which I'm, it's my area, I'm very familiar with, um, but also environmental and social determinants. So air quality, exposures, diet, access to care, and so many other items play a significant, if not a uh, larger role in someone's health than uh, the um, genetic makeup or uh, the particular uh, diseases that the, the person has at the moment. So predictive models in medicine, we require a lot of data in order to build reliable models. So AI requires a whole lot of large and representative data sets. So we need to build this access to large data repositories to improve research, but we need to do in a way that protects privacy of the individuals and privacy of the institutions involved. We need to aggregate data from different countries if we are to uh, make discoveries at a faster pace than we do today. So there's the dilemma that gets to all of us. Uh, electronic health records, for example, is it right to share them since people have not been explicitly asked? Uh, is it right not to share because new discoveries and acceleration will depend on that sharing? And can we share without moving data around? Can we share with explicit permission of the individuals? And that's one aspect of it. So I will briefly say that the All of Us program, which we participate in, is an NIH large initiative, is exactly doing that, is a, a building um, a large and diverse uh, data set by asking people to actively contribute their data from electronic health records, as well as physical measurements and other items that uh, roll into the protocol for the this development of this cohort. Um, and Right now, there are uh, many institutions already making use of the data available through this program to researchers at large, currently in the US, but soon in other countries as well. Uh, so there is a, 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 a treasure trove of data there, and uh, it's important that it includes several items, including some environmental items, but perhaps not as many as we would um, want. Uh, another aspect of it is the diversity of the people involved because traditionally many segments of the population were left out of research studies. Uh, and one segment in particular that we're studying is at mixed populations. And this is part of another NHGRI initiative uh, because we know at mixed populations improve the power of variant discovery, portability, and genome-wide association studies, as well as in predictive models and in other areas. One of those uh, predictive models that is coming along uh, is polygenic risk scores. So to use the genetic information as well as phenotypic information and hopefully uh, social determinants as well as environmental data to uh, be able to uh, assess risk for particular individuals and then do something uh, preventive or therapeutic about uh, uh, the diseases for those individuals. The problem is, uh, as this uh, polygenic risk scores are produced, uh, methods need to be improved. Um, for example, the scores may be, uh, have a need for continuous update. Uh, we'll, all of this uh, generate or introduce more disparities and more discrimination than already uh, some uh, healthcare algorithms uh, introduce. Can we also protect privacy, uh, particular with some of this uh, forgotten uh, populations were also the ones the least likely to trust uh, biomedical research. And what do we do with individuals from mixed ancestry? Um, so it, it's a center of at mixed science and technology uh, for uh, genomics for everyone. And, and I'll tell you how that relates to environmental 
data, which is the topic of today. So think of a trait of a disease, for example, as a function of genetic determinants of health, as well as environmental and social determinants. So if we are to develop an individualized uh, risk, we need to know all of these items. And we're working hard on getting whole genome sequences from from individuals, for example, in order to assess variant effects and also ancestry, uh, hereditary um, effects. Uh, but we also need to collect exposures, diet, uh, education, and all social determinants in order uh, to determine uh, the risk for a particular trait. So we need to do this in, um, in a way that the algorithms to analyze uh, data can stay in their end. So in short, our vision is that no one will be left behind and we will increasingly replace concepts that are being used today for race and ethnicity with a combination of genetic, environmental and social determinants of health because each individual is different. Different not only in the genetics, but in, in the way the, the, the course of life proceeded. Uh, so we will develop new methods and tools that allow, allow model findings to be applicable to all and not be uh, as they are today, mostly referring to the majority of population that does participate in clinical trials and observational studies. So with that, I want to thank everyone uh, and uh, thank NIH for sponsoring several projects related to this. And uh, again, thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ono Machado. Um, very interesting. I've been taking notes um, all morning, lots of good ideas for how we can advance this field. So getting really excited for the conversation. Next, we're gonna hear from Dr. Marzia Gassemi. She's an assistant professor at MIT in electrical engineering and computer science and at the Institute for Medical Engineering and Science. Professor Gassemi focuses on creating and applying machine learning to understand and improve health in ways that are robust and private and fair. And previously, she was a visiting researcher with Alphabets, Verily, and an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Before she got her PhD in computer science at MIT, she received a master of science degree in biomedical engineering from Oxford University as a Marshall Scholar and a BS in computer science and electrical engineering as a Goldwater Scholar at New Mexico University. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Gassemi. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about designing machine learning processes for equitable health systems. Um, and uh, the thing that I want you to keep in mind is we all have a focus and a goal, I think, of creating actionable insights in human health. But to get there, we really need to understand how we build models to perform well or be healthy, um, how we decide which data is most appropriate to be used in model training, what kind of healthcare we want to represent, and what kind of behaviors we want to encourage in um, end deployments when we couple machine learning models with um, human usage. And so, Let's say that we have a patient, Sumana, who's having trouble breathing, and so she goes into the emergency department. It's very late, and uh, you know she she's told, "Hey, we took a chest X-ray. You might have pneumonia, but we really need somebody to come and look at it. It's swamped, and so it's going to be three hours. You can wait here for three hours for a doctor to look at your chest X-ray, or we have a machine learning model." They can look at it right now. And this machine learning model performs at or above humans at this task of saying, you're healthy, you're in triage, you can go home, you don't need to be seen, or you should wait around in the hospital. And so which would you choose? You can have this AI screen you now, or you can wait for three hours for a human. This isn't a hypothetical uh, situation. This is actually the situation that we're in with several clinical AI that perform at or above humans in a range of tasks across the human lifespan. Um, and this is a paper from uh, our to be keynote speaker soon, uh, Eric Topol, 
that I really enjoyed from a few years ago, really demonstrating that across these different um, settings, we have AI that is no longer a calculator or a simple toy. It's now performing in ways that are uh, really impressive. But the issue is, um, you know, even once a model is regulated and the FDA does regulate uh, software as a medical device, um, we have some questions maybe about exactly the performance that we might get in different settings. And the reason we have this is AI learns from humans, um, both in terms of the data that we generate and feed into the model and in terms of the design decisions that we make when we do optimization of these models towards some training objective. Um, and so we have some issues with the current medical data that exists. So if we're looking at just the data that exists, for example, in randomized controlled trials or top tier journals, medical journals, that data is often very sparse because RCTs are very hard to run. It's often uh, very narrowly scoped. So most of the RCT populations are not diverse. And so the findings may apply in varying levels to a more diverse population. And then medical reversals happen more commonly than you might imagine, where we run an RCT, we get a result, it's standard of care, and then there's a reversal years later saying, actually, that's not the way that we should do things. Um, if you look at patient records in large databases, so let's say 250 million patients, um, you might imagine, well, can we just mimic what happens um, with patient care? Can I just look at your nearest neighbor in sort of treatment space? But even for extremely common conditions like hypertension, depression, and diabetes, um, it's been found that uh, large proportions, uh, so almost a quarter actually of hypertension patients, uh, follow completely unique treatment pathways. So that means they would have zero nearest neighbors if you were saying, you know, there's no RCT for you. Let's just look up what worked for a patient like you. But unfortunately, you know, the, the, the solution here is to have better improved data, right? And larger, that 250 million patient population was not large enough. Health data really lags um, as compared to other machine learning subfields. So when we compare machine learning for health to natural language processing or computer vision or just general machine learning, machine learning and health papers tend to not release code as often, not release data as often, and not leverage multiple data sets as often, which leads to a substandard of reproducibility that is not common in the machine learning space. So let's walk through what I just talked about. Let's say that uh, you've engaged me as the machine learning researcher to go through and train a model um, because you want to do this triage example. So if I take the three largest chest X-ray data sets that exist, that's over 700,000 chest X-ray images for the United States, and I train a dense net, a kind of convolutional neural network to predict no finding. It means the patient is healthy, you can send them home. And I uh, get the best possible performance, state of the art, just like the paper. Maybe one thing I would want to compare is the false positive rate in different subpopulations. And I could call that an underdiagnosis rate because if you had a higher rate of false positives, I say you're healthy when you actually have pneumonia or another condition in one subpopulation like female patients, this would lead to this deployed model having a higher rate of no treatment for patients who actually need it in that subpopulation. So we do this and we find that the state of the art model has the largest underdiagnosis rate in female patients, young patients, Black patients and patients on Medicaid insurance. And intersectional identities have it worse than aggregated groups. That means if you're a Black or Hispanic female patient, you are underdiagnosed more than white female patients or than female patients generally. And you might think this is a very simple point that we should just audit models. Maybe we should uh, ask the FDA to create very specific categories of uh, insurance type, um, uh, sex at birth, of self-reported ethnicity, and all of these software as medical devices that get approved, they also have to hit certain bars um, within those categories. That would be a great start, but this can get really complicated. So everybody loves language models, right? And note completion is actually one of the tasks that GPT is being used for right now. In fact, Epic has an add-on with OpenAI, where if you start out the patient's note, it'll auto-complete it for you. Um, so we took Cybert, which is a transformer model, um, so a contextual language model, and uh, we took a real sentence from a real patient's note in the Boston area, and we filled in the first word, the patient's race, so blank patient became below trend and violent, sent to, and we asked the model to fill in the blank. If we say that the patient was Caucasian or white, the model fills in the rest of their note with they were sent to the hospital. If we say the patient was African, African-American, or Black, the model fills in the rest of the note with sent to prison. This is not a simple audit category. 
that you could just check for every model. These kinds of associations that we learn are going to be very deeply proxied within the data that we use, especially as we get into large language models and other high capacity models that use lots and lots of human generated data with human biases. And biases are a really strong part of the clinical landscape and they're not something you can simply escape. How, how strong are they, you say? Pop quiz number one. So this is a real medical note as well, but we've redacted the patient's self-reported race from this note. Can you tell from this nursing progress note what the patient's self-reported race is? Uh, in the clinicians that we surveyed, the, they could not. So this is not something humans are good at at all. They just guess. But machine learning models can. And some of the clues they're using are maybe fair game, like in the Northeast, which is where we did the study, uh, there are more African-American patients that have uh, dialysis due to hypertension. However, we tested this in two data sets in Boston and New York. Uh, so that's over 4 million notes that we evaluated it on. And we found that a lot of the statistical power that these uh, language models are, are um, gaining from, uh, from running over all these notes are uh, things that maybe we wouldn't want a model to generally use, but it does use because that's actually what's in the data that we are generating. Like if you talk about a patient's skin at all, that patient is probably white because there are very, very few references to skin-related diagnostics of disease in darker skinned patients. Or if you use the word difficult um, to describe a patient or their family, that patient is probably African-American. And maybe you can see how that would happen. Tiny ways that I describe a patient or their family over time and the notes would add up and a large language model can you know, read between the lines and see what kind of patient you're talking about. What about chest x-rays? Surely there is nothing proxied in here. Can you tell if this patient's self-reported race, not genetic ancestry, just self-reported race, which I will say has a very heterogeneous um, uh, genetic ancestry associated with it for most categories we are talking about. So is this patient black? Radiologists cannot tell. We surveyed them. Uh, we tested them and they can't. But when we look at several different data sets from uh, both uh, uh, major chest X-ray releases and also from a data set that was more um, race balanced from Emory University, we find that here neural models can tell uh, the self-reported race of a patient with extremely high performance. Um, and then we look for the proxies. We ask the radiologist, tell us every cheat code do you think that a machine learning model could be using here? Just like in the note example, where it was looking at, do you talk about the patient's skin? Are you, you know, calling a patient uh, difficult? It's not body mass index, breast density, bone density, or disease distribution. In fact, this is information in the frequency range, which we suspect, although we cannot prove because we do not have uh, photos of the patient's skin, is related to the melanation level of your skin. Darker skin has uh, more refraction of x-rays uh, and of most radiation. And these tiny, tiny differences in the frequency spectrum are not things that are ever perceptible to human doctors. It's trivially obvious to a convolutional neural network. So much so that even when you bandpass filter these images to where they do not really look like chest x-rays anymore, you can still tell a patient's self-reported race. And so what are some ways that we can try to improve these models if these are issues, uh, these deeply proxied associations? One of the things we can do is explicitly include fairness constraints and design things for what they're intended for. For example, if you need a parsimonious model like a decision support checklist, don't build a complex model and explain it down, just build the thing that you actually want. Now, when we, humans come together to create decision support checklists or risk scores, often it's very difficult. They have to come to consensus. And then years later, we'll figure out that actually those risk scores we created, they're really biased and they over or underestimate risk, for example, in this paper for African-American patients across many different clinical subspecialties. Um, if we learn an optimally predictive checklist from ICU data as a mixed integer programming problem that directly minimizes error with fairness constraints, we can do things like predict mortality after continuous renal replacement therapy in the ICU, but ensure fairness across intersectional groups. And so if you put no fairness constraints, you might get a checklist like this, predict mortality after this treatment if three or more items are checked. This is not referencing your gender or your self-reported ethnicity. Uh, it's also not using any obvious proxies. So an obvious proxy for sex at birth would be height or weight. Um, those aren't in here. There's nothing obvious for self-reported race. 
But this checklist with no fairness constraints is no better than a human-made checklist. It has a max false positive rate gap between Black uh, women and white men of over 50%. When we include constraints from the get-go, we get a model that performs much more fairly and could potentially be used in a deployment. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about in technical uh, problems is subpopulation shift, which is a huge area in machine learning generally. There's many categories of it. You could have spurious correlations, attribute imbalances, class imbalances, or just attribute generalization. And we have many data sets that fall into each of these categories. Some of them are medical, such as uh, mimic notes or chest x-ray data sets. Some of them are not medical at all. They're just large machine learning data sets that people use as standard benchmarks when they make new algorithms. Well, we benchmarked all of these state-of-the-art algorithms that we could find that perform really well in published papers on these tasks. And we found that these existing algorithms really improve spurious correlation and class imbalance, but they really don't improve other shifts because often shifts get lumped together when people evaluate their models. This is a problem because we have to improve both representations and classifiers to get to these better attribute generalization results that we don't currently have with state-of-the-art models. A final note, if you use some of these subpopulation shift papers, is they often optimize for worst group accuracy, but that is often inversely correlated with worst group precision, which is maybe the thing that matters more in many healthcare applications. So I'm going to uh, skip the content for the last part because I don't want to cheat the panel. Um, the last thing that uh, I'll say is we've done some evaluations where we've deployed models and we've asked uh, specific loaded questions in high stakes decision-making settings. And we've given biased GPT advice to people in different ways. And we've found that the, uh, the use of specific AI doesn't matter sometimes as much if you have a biased AI or not biased AI as the exact way that you give the advice to people, either with descriptive or prescriptive advice. And here we found that clinicians listen to biased prescriptive advice, but not to biased descriptive advice. Um, and if we want to get to safe integration, we should take lessons from places where there are self safe technology deployments like aviation. There are many federal agencies that could have a role in regulation and uh, uh, you know, advice for technology companies and recommendations for developers for how to safely integrate AI into healthcare spaces. Um, but there are some things that are going to be unique to health that we need to figure out as a community in panels like this. So uh, inequity and underlying data processes that will be learned and automated, uh, like gender concordance, increases a patient's probability of heart attack survival. And that effect is driven by increased mortality when male physicians treat female patients. That would be like if male pilots crashed more when they were flying with female passengers, or patient-physician race match improves medication adherence, um, and many other things. That would be like if Black patients only got in-flight safety announcements when a Black pilot was flying. Or a majority of Muslim women experience poor quality care and maternal services with indicated stereotypical or discriminatory behavior. That would be like if Muslim passengers were always randomly checked by the TSA, which is true. That one's in there for me. That's an actual true one, just FYI. Um, there's no simple fixes here. This is going to be an ongoing process. We should consider sources of bias in our data, evaluate models comprehensively, and recognize not all gaps can be fixed. This is uh, work from a fantastic team. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gassemi. All right, so now it's time for discussion. This is my favorite part. Um, so we please put questions in the chat if you're online, here in the room, if, if you have any immediate reactions, things that you're excited about, um, feel free to jump right in. Well, I'll ask a question. Yeah. So this this was probably to Dr. Ono Machado. Um, I was really excited to see you thinking about the incorporation of other types of data into those PRS models that you talked about. And I'd love to hear if if you have good examples of that working. I mean, so where where do you see that happening? Where where is that actually being used, or is it being used? And and can it? Where do you think it might have the best uh, implications for use? Um, yeah, I think. Currently, it's more use of social determinants than environmental data, to, to be completely clear. Uh, but the, the concept is the same, right? If you want to individualize, um, we should, um, you know, get the, the more specifics we can about the person, which, of course, in order to build models would require even more and more data. You know, every uh, variable we 
add, it implies a lot of observations to be added as well. Uh, but I think in, in healthcare algorithms as, as well, not, not, I think AI was very instrumental in bringing the issue to attention, but it has been there all along. With, with simple statistical models as well. Um, there is currently a, a lot of interest in um, understanding more the, the biases created by algorithms and how to regulate, how to mitigate those biases or eliminate. Um, so it's an area of active research right now. Um, I, I would say, it, Algorithms that have been historically used in healthcare are being uh, rethought uh, as to whether they are fair and whether they are actually improving care rather than, um, you know, creating more disparities. Great question. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, fantastic uh, presentation. I have the. Question for the last speaker, but uh, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce. Oh, oh sorry. Um, fantastic presentation. I have a question for the last speaker. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce correctly for the uh, for, for the name. Um, it's very interesting for um for you to show the example of how the language model generate uh, different things uh, for different race. And uh, I read some paper also on the same direction. Um, but the issue is. Uh, Devising for machine learning models uh, become a little bit difficult when, say, when a large language model comes, because and they also notice that uh, when this kind of large language model can be used on um, widely uh, a wide range of tasks, this kind of bias will be propagated to uh, a lot of uh, different uh, downstream tasks, uh, and the devising become more difficult. Do you have any like uh, and, uh, suggestions on that direction? Sure. Uh, so I think what you're asking is uh, when you train, you can decouple in machine learning processes, training a representation, right, that maybe could apply to many different downstream tasks, which large language models are, are an example of, and a, a classifier that you apply to the to the representation. And I think you're, what you're asking is um, when we train representations right now, like large language models or other, you know, large high capacity models um, that contain biases, it, it may be very difficult to remove them because they are going to be applied to many, many downstream tasks. And so it's it's difficult to do like a, a one um a one spot fix. Is that accurate? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Uh so there are a few papers. Um, we've looked into this a little bit, uh, but there's also some topology papers actually uh, at machine learning conferences that are trying to focus on if I if I know that there is some statistical bias in my data that is not desirable or a, a part of this larger ball that I'm I'm learning, right? If my representation space is a big sphere, if I know some place in the sphere is undersampled or is shaped weird or is just kind of you know spiky because it's not smooth. I haven't seen tons and tons of examples. And so I don't have this smooth space that I can generalize on. Maybe there are ways for us to use augmentation, right? So take an example in a space where there are very few examples and do small perturbations of it so that we fill in sort of that part of the space and we get less anomalies. Um, there's also other work on instead of trying to you know, generate data that sort of addresses this either by actually sampling it from real people or augmenting the data you have. Just knowing when your model is out of distribution, somebody hands you a trained model, how do you know that it is in a, um, you know, the popular term for this is hallucination, right? How do you know that it's in an extrapolation space where it's not interpolating between answers that it knows, it's kind of out here beyond anything it's seen. It's in this extrapolation regime. Um, and so there, there are some works that are also focusing on that. So you could think about it from either side. Great, thanks. And we have a question from online from Claudio Sorrentino, who asks, how would you suggest applying the development of AI models to evaluate cumulative impacts of pollution to communities? I might throw that one to you, Dr. Bryce. So <clears throat> you need to do two things. 
first of all, you need to be able to understand what those cumulative impacts are. So you need to have data to understand kind of what the breadth of the uh, environmental risk factors are, are going to be and how do you quantify those. And then you need access to the health data to look at kind of the relationships there. And those are those are the challenges I think we're talking about today. How do, how do you integrate across those two dimensions? So I think it's hard to do right now, but I think it's where we're trying to get to going forward by having access to environmental data uh, in a comprehensive way, and as well as the health data that we've just heard talking about right now. So how do you how do you look at somebody's, how do you predict somebody's risk factor for heat stress, mm. for example? And then how do you uh, use that in a, in a clinical setting to minimize their risks by making sure that if you know that somebody doesn't have air conditioning, and you know somebody lives in inner city where it's hotter, uh, and you know somebody is, you know, got a physiological condition that puts them at risk. And and then you, you know something about what the temperature they're being exposed to over the period of time. How do you collect all those data? How do you integrate all those data? Then how do you do something to minimize any heat stress or hospitalization or ED visit that might be a consequence of that? And then as I go back to a point I made earlier, then once you figure something out, how do you go back and double check and make sure that you evaluate whether it's working or not? So that's that's just one example, but I think I think you're asking um, a good question and that's part of the challenge before us today. I was thinking about that also, you know, one of the things that I feel like uh, can be the focus is like this individualized approach, but I think, you know, the word communities and that question was really interesting. And I always come back to the idea of, you know, Flint, Michigan, like if we had um, AI looking for trends um, in blood lead levels or in lead levels in the water, could we have prevented something like that? And what can we be doing to prevent something like that in communities or populations? I don't know if you want to comment. Yeah, I think that's a perfect example. I think that's a great idea. So we we collect a lot of environmental surveillance data, uh, and I'll put blood lead in there as, as a environmental surveillance data, even though it's a human-based measurement. Uh, and and we don't do a good job of mining it, and we don't do a job a good job of doing exactly what you said. How do we how do we use that to anticipate uh, when a risk is about to happen, rather than waiting, in the case of Flint, Michigan, for a year or so after the switch, to show that the blood levels, oh yeah, they went up. Uh, you know, we need to be able to use the data to anticipate that problem, as I said before, and that's a great example. <clears throat> And then also, Claudio, thank you um, for your question. So uh, the next question he posed is, can AI help identify critical parameters to evaluate and predict cumulative impacts? And, you know, this term cumulative impacts might not be well known by everybody. So I'll take a step back and just sort of explain my uh, perspective on what cumulative impacts are. So it's the idea that communities um, that may be unfairly impacted by environmental issues are unfairly impacted by a lot of environmental issues. So if you're exposed to high levels of lead in your drinking water, the likelihood that you're also exposed to high levels of crime in your neighborhood or that you're also exposed to um higher levels of uh, unemployment or, and so all of these different exposures become cumulative and they may add up in ways that is not additive, but actually um, like exponential, they, the, the impacts that they can have are more than you would expect if you added those risks together. So I think Claudio is, is trying to get at is, um, we haven't been good in risk assessment and environmental health risk assessment. We tend to look at one chemical or one exposure at a time and estimate risk. So can we use AI to look at all these risks? It's sort of like that exposome type of approach. Um, so I'll just throw that out to anybody on the committee who wants to answer. And Claudio, I hope I didn't take your question in the wrong direction. Yes, Daryl. Yes, Megan. I wanted to uh, second that motion in terms of we do have um frameworks that we're building um with of course the um support of the NIEHS but um more often than not um these chemical and non-chemical stressors as we were talking um Lucinda I think talked about that as well um one exacerbates the other and so the polygenic approach in terms of risk trajectories 
that we should be looking at and turning that into um, you know, risk model, but the cumulative, we've been talking about that since Charles Lee in the early 2000s, and I'm happy that we are finally getting there. Yes, mm-hmm. definitely moving in the right direction, but I see a lot of opportunity for AI to help with it. I don't know yeah. if that's happening yet. Well, no, I, yeah. I, I and, and I worry <clears throat> from uh, the standpoint of underrepresented communities with respect to um, you know, the medical records and the inherent bias. I mean, we're covering it. We're getting there, but um, no, we aren't moving fast enough. But um, the speakers um, did a wonderful job. I was really hopeful now that we can um, close the gap. Yeah. That's great. Hope is a good thing. There's a great Langston Hughes quote, I think, or is it Maya Angelou about hope is a caged bird? Is that right? My poor uh, English teacher. So I, I think the question, though, hits at the heart of what we're trying to talk about today is data integration. How do you how do you combine all these data to identify all these cumulative stressors? Uh, and they're sitting in different places, and they're they're accessible in different ways. They have different data structures. They have different time frames. They have different ge- geographic frames. Uh, and so this is a perfect place to think about how do we integrate that. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that when we're thinking about these cumulative exposures, the action items and and, and thinking through very carefully our methods and our techniques, which levers do you pull, right? If you're measuring everything from employment opportunities, commuting outcomes, on-road emissions, water quality, noise pollution, (laughs) crime stress, and indoor air pollution, outdoor air pollution, where your schools are, what are your schools exposed to? Um, When children are spending eight hours a day, school right on top of a 10 lane highway. So AI allows us, or just, you know, big data allows us this data integration, but as policymakers, as clinicians, as local community organizers, advocates, and so forth, what levers have the greatest pull? And how do we integrate these and accurately tease out where can we make some biggest impacts? Where are our biggest hot spots? And that comes back to the methods, right? And this and, and, and finding these spurious correlations. So I just kind of wanted to add that little fine point to what's our end goal once we put these things together. I agree. Yeah. So what how do we actually impact health? How do we make a difference with limited resources? Where are we going to drive those resources? Yeah, absolutely. Great point. Thank you. So one thing I I might say on the health side is sometimes people try to propose technology as a solution where it's not a good solution. Um, So even if we look at the um, lead levels in Flint, Michigan, right? Like that was a result of state emergency managers changing the city's water supply, right? And maybe we could have anticipated that this is something that uh, would have happened. And I don't know if an AI telling them, hey, do you realize that these old lead line pipes are are dangerous, would have changed their their action, right? Like this is a cost cutting measure. And so I think one of the things we need to understand is AI is this really great, really powerful tool for data analysis, for giving us better information. We're not always great at using that information when we get it. And so um, there's a big push in the machine learning community right now some of you may have heard for um, your sort of two camps, you know, this sort of um, alignment camp that's saying we need to align AI with with human objectives. And then there's maybe this other camp called the safety community that says, well, you know, we shouldn't just try to align it. We should just use it as a tool and use it safely. I, I think these are two different mindsets, but they're both hinting at the same thing, that unless we know what we want from AI as a society, people will use it for whatever they want. And that might individually create really uh, poor effects. Yeah, I would agree. And in the the medical area, there's also, you know, you need to know why you're creating a model and whether you're listening to it or not. And if not, uh, again, why? So so it's not simply um, saying, well, we could have... uh, detected this, the fact that we, we didn't, right? And the fact is also that um, we didn't uh, in many cases, no, no, not this specific one, but in many cases, because there are so many false positives of others that we would not have investigated 
each one of them. So I think the whole area of um, post-marketing surveillance of devices, medications, or even surveillance in general safety. Surveillance is, um, you know, has been evolving again, even before AI became more popular, but it's always caught in this um, dilemma, right? Uh, how, how, um, how do, do we have ability to respond to signals and, and do we have uh, in, enough um, specificity in, in this alerts and alarms so that we can act upon them? So, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very tricky area. So we have some more questions from online. Olivia Harris asks, have there been AI analyses of situations where most medical errors occur? Or would fatigued healthcare provider factors overwhelm analysis? Oh, I can say that there have been several studies of medical errors in, in many uh, areas prior to AI. Again, yeah. AI analysis would be possible uh, as long as there are enough data, labeled data, I would say uh, about this, uh, because just counting on um, outcomes uh, does not would not necessarily indicate the errors, right? Uh, so sometimes you, you do the right decision, but the outcome uh, is not favorable. Uh, so I would say, uh, there have been analysis, and, and many analysis also indicated um, fatigue being a, a factor or a poor user interfaces and in things like that. I think uh, Lucilla is exactly right. We know this is a problem without AI, right? And so one of the things that we have to think about is when, when we train models, we're training them on the data that exists. And I love her point. It would need to be labeled. Can you imagine asking a hospital to go back through their records and label every single decision made by a clinical staff member that could amount to malpractice? I, I don't think that would happen. And so one of the things we have to you know, consider is machine learning runs either on millions, billions of examples with no labels, and it learns, well, this is the way you act. You haven't told me how to act, but I see how you do it, and I'll just do it that way and accept that it's going to sometimes act like a fatigue doctor, a doctor that used a poor user interface, a doctor that didn't have the right, con whatever those situations are and make errors, or we have to decide that we want to go back and uh, somehow create an accounting of these are things that should not happen. If they ever happen in the data, don't use that data. That should not be used, but that's not in the data that gets sold to private companies for the models that they create that gets, even without large language models or any high, high capacity models, even if you're just training logistic regression or XGBoost models, you're training with error in there and you're training with maybe error that affects different people differently. David, did you have your hand up? I do have my hand up. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into uh, the Laura's question, because mm -hmm. um, I was actually formulating a very similar question. Um, you know, when we are trying to integrate, you know, use AI to integrate all of these extremely highly correlated mm -hmm. factors, um, you, you, uh, Dr. Kasemi, you, you, you touched a little bit on this in, in your presentation. You know, how much can we use this to tease out? You know, what is just kind of a spurious correlation? You know, yeah. you, people are. Uh, of an underrepresented minority, they also are living in a low SES community right. with high proximity to traffic because of different policies. You know, all of these are going to be showing up as drivers. And how do we identify which one is the one that we want to target for intervention? So um, I, I think there's maybe two parts to this. One is what data do we even have? For a long time, we didn't have any social determinants data, and so you could not use it. Um, and now we do in many data sets, thankfully, thanks to uh, efforts like uh, Lucilla's with the All of This data set that I'm a huge fan of. Uh, there are social determinants questions in that data. 
And so uh, I think we're starting to look at whether we can integrate that data into an analysis. Um, we have a paper that's coming out in a month at the AIDS conference, which is one of the AI ethics and society conferences um, that, that the community runs, uh, demonstrating that in um, hospital tasks specifically, so acute care tasks, social determinants data that we found at a state level in Massachusetts did not improve prediction in general population. It did improve specificity of machine learning models in specific tasks for minority groups, right? And so, for example, if you're looking at Black patients and trying to predict um, outcomes for diabetics when they're hospitalized, they're having social determinants data did help a lot with specificity. But just as a general thing you throw into a model, it's not a, um, it's not a solution, a simple solution, because you have to imagine things like self-reported race and um, social determinants are deeply proxied in data and they are deep proxies for other things in data. Just like in that CRT example where we made that checklist, I can't see what the proxies are. What, what could this be? Um, it was still an incredibly biased checklist, right? And until we included explicit fairness constraints, it was not addressed. And so this is an ongoing area of research that we need to work on. When we have tried as researchers to decouple information about self-reported race or um, sex at birth or social determinants from clinical data and then take this decoupled, you know, sort of washed data and then use it for clinical tasks, it models don't perform as well in all cases, right? And so for some data, there's information that's being deeply proxied in different parts. And so we have a couple papers we're working on now on the completely machine learning side, just trying to understand how do you remove enough information about somebody's, for example, self-reported race or sex at birth, if that's information you don't want um, out, or uh, about their social determinants, if you don't want stratified care, you don't want to learn these sort of weird social things that we have or poor uh, systemic injustices that exist. How do you remove that while retaining enough information that you can actually perform the clinical task that you care about? And it's a, it's a very hard question, but it's one that more diverse open healthcare data like the All of Us data set and others would be extremely helpful with. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example too um, in the COVID crisis in, in which <laughs> we, we analyzed data from uh, several uh, health systems, 14 health systems, large ones, including the VA. And uh, he, we were showing in hospitalized patients that the mortality of um, patients identified as uh, Hispanic uh, was lower than the mortality of uh, Caucasian patients, for example, which is against the, um, you know, you know what, what, whatever, everything else we were hearing. Uh, so I want to emphasize the importance of having experts who, who know the data and who can uh, explain certain things because once we did the multivariate analysis, it was clear that age was the, the factor that was really leading to higher mortality. And it happened that the white population was older than the uh, Hispanic uh, or the ethnicity Hispanic in that case, which again, age being the major driver, if you have um, a correlation of Hispanics uh, that were hospitalized being younger, you would see a lower mortality of that group anyways, right? So, so the interpretation of all these models and what, um, you know, AI or some modern predictive model is telling you, it, it's something we need to be extremely careful about because we can make, again, this whole movement of liberating data and so on is interesting, is, is important, but uh, the, you know, misinformation is everywhere. And, and miss an interpretation of models would be even worse because now they are data driven and someone is using the data and just interpreting in the wrong manner. Lucilla, would that data that you just referred to, mm -hmm. is that at the county level or census tract block group? Or Those block were group? hospitalized patients, so it's electronic health. Aggregate. Records. Okay, I was just trying to figure out your source. Yeah, from so it's, it's those who, who 
you know, access to care was no longer an issue because they were already hospitalized, right? And wow. then they, okay. they were receiving Thank care uh, uniformly. That that's what it seemed to to indicate to us that there were no uh, adjusted for other factors. There were no uh, mortality differences. So I think we have time maybe for one last quick question. Um, so, and, and I'm going to kind of change it a little bit. Dipanjana Malik asked if you think historical database on stressors and biomarkers should be developed using routine health checkup data and environment data. And that was one of the questions I've had as we've been talking, you know, everybody's like, all of us is great, but there was also a comment that all of us doesn't really have a lot of environmental data in it. So, um, yet, <laughs> yes. So maybe that's sort of thinking about next steps, right? That's the whole point of this workshop. Where do, how, how can we advance it? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And so that's the challenge before us. I mean, how do we, how do we get better environmental data? And then how do we get it into a system that can interact with health records? So it's very easy for childhood asthma, for example, to talk to a clinician and say, the, the treating asthma is, is the, you know, the kids who have uncontrolled asthma because they don't have access to a physician and they don't take their, they don't have access to medications. Uh, and then of course you talk to environmental health scientists who say, you know, because they got cockroaches in, in their house and they got bad air quality in their house. And there's all these environmental determinants of asthma. They're exposed to violence in the community. There's because huge stressors and there's all these environmental things that cause asthma. And we don't really sort this out very well because mm -hmm. we don't, those two data sets don't coexist in a, in a way that allow us to look at kind of what the, what the whole, constellation of drivers are, uh, and it's obviously some combination, and speaking back to, to David's point before, we, we can use that to determine what's the best bang for the buck in terms of, you know, what do we want to do with that? You know, there's, there's, studies, there's studies that show that, you know, putting an air cleaner in someone's home is, is as efficient as putting them on controller medications for asthma management. You know, and an air conditioner costs a fraction of what controller medications do, but the health system won't pay for an air cleaner in someone's home. So, so, but how do you build the system to allow us to make answer, ask questions like that and answer questions like that, I think is why we're at the table. Yeah, that was a great, I feel like that was the perfect summary. We have one minute left, so I might just draw us to a close unless either the other two panelists wanted to throw something else in there quickly. I just want to agree with Alison Motzinger's comment that the All of Us program is working hard to incorporate environmental data. Yes, and David said the same thing in the room. Yes, thank you. Well, perfect. So thank you so much to our, our panelists and to um, the folks online and in the room for a great conversation. I think this is really setting us up for some diving deeper into a lot of these issues and coming up with some plans for what we can actually do to better integrate all of these different fields. So um, I think we have a five minute break. So enjoy.
Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody back to session two. Um, title of the session is Leveraging AI ML for Environmental Health and Biomedical Data Integration. Um, I'll introduce myself first for the speakers. Um, my name is David Reif. I'm chief of the Predictive Toxicology Branch at NIEHS. And what we do is very relevant to this workshop. Um, our branch uses expertise in data science, toxicogenomics, spatial temporal exposures, computational methods, and new approach methodologies to advance predictive toxicology applications. Um, prior to joining NIEHS last fall, I was a professor of bioinformatics at North Carolina State University, um, where my lab was focused on data integration for environmental health sciences and toxicology. So I'm delighted to be part of this workshop and uh, really look forward to an on, for doing the engaging session. Um, our uh, objective with session two is to provide research studies and use cases of first how integrating environmental, biomedical, and health data uh, is important to understanding human health and disease. And secondly, how AI ML can be used um, in the pipeline for these data. So uh, for this session, we're going to have three presentations um, followed by about 30 minutes of QA um, panel discussion similar to the last session. Um, so, you know, we'll hopefully try to keep each speakers to, you know, 10 to 12 minutes for the presentations, but we do have that buffer time built in at the end for discussion. So I hope we have time for a good, robust discussion. Um, so I'll start out um, by uh, introducing our, our first speaker. Um, very lucky to have Dr. Shrag Patel, um, who's an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Harvard Medical School. Um, his primary research interests include developing multiscale computational and data science methods to dissect the role of environmental exposures and genetic factors in complex traits and disease, um, with an emphasis on a trajectory from obesity to diabetes and its complications. Um, Dr. Patel is recognized as a leader in exposomic science, um, developing methods to map systems of dietary and environmental exposure factors with disease. Um, so I'd like to uh, turn it over to Dr. Patel. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you all for having me. It's an incredible honor to be here to talk about multimodal AI. I think a extremely timely timely topic given the emergence of some of the the approaches that we've seen earlier today in the data. Um, you'll find that I'm reiterating a lot of the things themes that we've talked about already. So hopefully uh, towards the end, I'll, I'll point out some things that we can uh, that we can add to the field here and complement to those awesome uh, stocks we heard before. So as you know, in informatics, for us in informatics, it's been a deluge of data coming from uh, biobank scale uh, as resources. Things like UK Biobank, now all of us, and existing resources such as NHANES, the CMS, Medicare data, uh, all have opportunities that uh, uh, we should discuss on how to make them useful, in particular with multimodal data coming from exposome, genome, and phenome. And, and we've seen great examples in the literature from genomics and phenomics. And so can we leverage these data sets along with multimodal AI techniques to make them useful? Uh, we've talked already about a lot of uh, approaches in clinical AI, some fantastic talks earlier. Uh, so the key questions that a clinical AI people are, are asking, just to reiterate, are to try to integrate these diverse data sets that may come from uh, diverse places, such as one's healthcare institution, uh, like a acute care setting, and try to mash up things that are ti uh, high frequency time series or low frequency time series, when you think of time to death, things like tabular data, spectral data, 1D spectra, 2D spectra, free text. And so you, you can see the diversity of data that are being uh, tackled in, in the current approaches for looking at multimodal data. Uh, and the current approaches might use some uh, uh, new cool ideas of in neural networks to create a, a, a new data process or a new data structure called an embedding. Essentially, it's a, it's a, a, uh, a new way to represent data that you can then input into your favorite uh, algorithms of choice to make some sort of uh, uh, learning algorithm work or make some sort of decision. So the key questions that emerge from these are, first of all, does when you have, have new modals of, uh, modalities of data, do they actually help you with, uh, with prediction? And so there's uh, multiple evidence that, that coming from uh, our folks in AI, uh, collaboration in, in AI su suggesting that they are. So here's a fantastic paper from Soeng Singh and colleagues, um, of which I think we'll hear more about this when Eric Topol gives his keynote about uh, how predictive capability here you're seeing AUC curves in, in fact increase for ser uh, several outcomes that are captured in this mimic data set. This is a, a data set used to, uh, uh, for, for machine learning uh, research 
to look at high frequency data coming from different sort of modalities. And you can see here from the AUC curves that when you increase the number of modalities for these different outcomes, you fact get a bump up on average. And this is what this figure here on the left panel is also showing. But in fact, it does divert. It does depend on the type of outcome you may be looking at. So can we tease apart the outcome from the modality in, in, in dissecting when our the capability increases? For us, environmental health uh, uh, studies, we're dealing with this, this complex exposome type of data set. So they come, might come from targeted mass spec, which may be tabular, or we may be looking at the spectra, like uh, uh, biomonitoring of lead, cadmium. We're looking at geospatial bio, uh, digital markers. So area level, we're seeing 2D spectra coming from images, which, are all, uh, which many of which we'll have talks about later uh, tomorrow, I think. So and aggregating this to a zip code or even a personal level. You have self-reported questionnaire information, very important, that are also tabular, giving us behavioral information, new modes of getting behavioral information from sensors, and of course, untargeted mass spec. So diverse types of data, diverse types of uh, examples here that we need to uh, integrate across to achieve this idea of the exposome of analyzing things in the multitude to, uh, to in fact, uh, uh, increase predictive power. So here's a great example of looking at the sort of the blood exposure, almost small molecules that are, might be indicative of, of environmental exposure. Uh, um, and uh, complementing this uh, are geospatial markers, other analytes that may soon be commoditized in, 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 in addition to those, uh, those markers. And of course, there's geospatial information emerging from satellites. Again, uh, diverse multimodal data sets. How do we stitch these things together? So first is, uh, I'll show us a couple of examples here of how people are doing this. Uh, here's one from nutritional, uh, our friends in nutritional epidemiology and AI. So here, uh, Ravi Shah, uh, Vank Murthy and colleagues were able to look at what we call the internal exposome or the metabolomic signatures that are related to dietary measures and then connect those signatures to, to uh, cardiovascular related traits like incident CBD and incident diabetes. And also to uh, use these metabolomics measures or the internal exposome or how the exposures respond, uh, can detect some biological response uh, to get a pattern of, of dietary exposures using this idea of canonical uh, uh, correlation analyses, and then connecting those patterns to incident CBD and, and CHD. So when I saw this, I was like, wow, you could actually get something that's trained on dietary behavior, those biological measures of the internal exposome or metabolome. And they'll, once they're trained, they can actually do better in predicting the outcome. There's just something, this biological signal that's also emerging from essentially predicting these behaviors. This is essentially what this figure is trying to show here from Ravi Shah and colleagues is that when they're predicting dietary behavior based on these uh, metabolomic measurements and then going forward to predict disease, you're actually doing better than the, the, uh, the self-reported recall measures themselves. And then they use this idea of dietary patterns using canonical correlation analysis, a, a very... Uh, old school approach, but uh, uh, with given these new sets of data have found uh, newfound uses. And then they've used a, this way of finding a pattern and then also looking at how these are related to the health, uh, healthy eating index and found that in certain circumstances, they might also be more predictive of diabetes and CBD. We and, and uh, of course, committee members like Allison uh, have developed uh, the poly exposure score. So this uh, supervised approach of developing a, a score that summarizes exposures across uh, di a diversity of domains. Here we used one uh, to uh, look at diabetes, undiagnosed diabetes in the UK Biobank. And our colleagues used the PEGS cohort to also in concept kind of validate what we had. And what we find is, and I think this is key for us looking at multimodal AI techniques, is how to compare it to the state of the art. And so one thing we did was looked at polygenic risk scores, and we found the poly exposure score did better with our, uh, with our measures. But of course, you also want to compare it to how people may be using this to screen populations in the clinic, like using blood pressure, like using family history like using glucose. And we're not as good as, uh, as, as, as the, poly, uh, the clinical risk scores, but you could ask the question of how well you can reclassify individuals who already have some sort of risk, latent risk for diabetes. Uh, maybe their uh, blood pressure is very high, their glucose are in the pre-diabetes range. You could ask the question, 
given that uh, that data, the clinical risk that you might have, how much does the, the exposures adding them actually add to reclassification? And we have some evidence that it's doing much better than, than genetics. It might be even uh, helpful for looking at individuals who have not been able to be screened yet for diabetes using the gold standard uh, measures such as undiagnosed diabetes. We are building these approaches of looking at uh, risk factors that are already strong for uh, particular uh, outcomes like COPD and looking at how the like other exposures might push people over the edge. For, uh, for example, if you're already smoking, already at high risk, but then if you start incre incrementally adding this information, how much better can you do in prediction for things like a lung function? And we'd say that uh, uh, in the UK Biobank, we're, we're comparable to using a polygenic risk score uh, across smoking status for COPD. I think the, the use of the deep learning technologies is also going to be very useful in integration of exposome information. It's a totally another approach of looking at new phenotypes for, for aging. So here, what we did was ask the question, can we predict uh, abdominal age or age uh, for uh, biological age given uh, magnetic resonance images from individuals in the UK biobank. So here's examples of images and we just applied some deep learning convolutional neural necks uh, against these, uh, these data to ask the question how old these people are and then figured out the residual of them. So given the pr prediction and the, their actual chronological age, is there any biological signal in that, in that residual? And in fact, we did find some uh, biological significance. We did ran a GWAS against the, those residuals, but we also ran an XWAS against the, the, that residual to find that uh, things that are, uh, that are lifestyle factors, such as pack years of smoking, alcohol, all connected with this accelerated age as, as measured by the deep learning alg algorithm, uh, exercise behaviors, uh, accelerometer-based physical activity, all connected also with, with decelerated age of, of, of ab abdominal age. And it's unpacked ways of looking at the data in, in different ways. For example, do these this exposome that ex intersects with pancreatic or abdominal aging actually uh, come first before diabetes and are, or they're independent, uh, sort of independent etiologically? Uh, these same tools can be used to look at uh, accelerometer data, uh, as we've uh, done here. I showed this as an example. We looked at biological aging with respect to uh, how, how people exercise. I think one uh, word of caution is that uh, when looking at these very complex approaches, multimodal AI, it's unclear how we even do the studies to begin with. Uh, the studies to begin with are, are, have a lot of things under the hood that we haven't really uh, figured out. Here's an example from just doing one at a time, simple epidemiology where we, where we, uh, uh, where we look at ingredients from the Boston Cooking School cookbook. And we see that there's a lot of, if you will, vibration around, around these, these studies that, uh, that lead to different relative risk estimates. So simple regressions, what happens when we start adding parameters to these models and, and under, trying to understand the, the, the risk? Uh, so here we would say that the John Schoenfeld, Johnny Anidis and colleagues, there are weak statistical evidence against some of these non-replicated inconsistent effects. And so the idea is once we, ex do we exacerbate the problem by looking at multimodalities and, and multiple parameters? So there's ways in meta science to sort of uh, uh, elucidate the role of, of study design. One is to throw the kitchen seek of compute against all these different factors and seeing which ones stick, which ones don't. The most robust should be uh, very robust to the data assumptions that one's, one might make. So we asked the question for, uh, for uh, all-cause mortality, for example, through all these study design parameters in, it could be different variables that you're adjusting for in your model. Do any of these affect the, the estimates that you might get or the hazard ratios you might get? And in fact, for many environmental factors, if you're looking at all-cause mortality, uh, in fact, do. Um, some of them are very consistent, like, uh, like cotinine, but some of them are, are wavering around that estimate. And, and so this is very, uh, this is generalizable across study sets. Here's an example using UK Biobank. And so the idea is you could use this type of approach to screen for those that are non-robust to your assumptions that you make in the modeling. And for example, here's one that has a risk profile for some of your models, and a, uh, and a protective uh, profile from uh, other models. So you may wanna say that this is something that's not robust, the assumptions uh, uh, you might make and filter that out from your, uh, from your future studies, for example. Um, so the technical opportunities and challenge for environmental health research are, are, are how do we integrate across the, these diverse scales, such as geography, tissue, time, uh, model systems, 
How do you evaluate uh, findings from new approaches and compare to the state of the art? And what data sets and approaches are need to establish benchmarks, which are very important to help us interpret findings for the, for the field? And I thank all of uh, my collaborators and, and look forward for the discussion. Thanks very much for having me. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, especially for, you know, the theme of the session is having examples and use cases, right? So I think um, we'll have a lot to seed our discussion later. Um, so I appreciate that very, very much. Um, it, thank you, Dr. Patel. And uh, our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Aidong Zhang, uh, who's a full professor of computer science in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at the University of Virginia. Um, she also holds joint appointments with the Department of Biomedical Engineering and the School of Data Science at the University of Virginia. And her research interests include uh, machine learning, data science, bioinformatics, uh, and health informatics. Um, so we look forward to the talk. Um, thank you, Dr. Zhang. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Should I share my slides or? Yes, I think what we're seeing up on the screen is, is your, your main slides, that looks correct, yeah. Okay, but should I share mine that, you know, so I can control it? Or this is from the audience, right? Oh, I don't know. Lily, are we running the slides from the room or, or should Dr. Zhang share yeah. yours? You can share your own if you'd like. Okay. Someone start did start sharing them for you, but it looks like you're pulling them up now. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, hold on. Hmm. I think you just want to go to display mode on the slides. Where is obsession? Oh, I don't understand this. So you. Uh... So uh, if you go to the bottom uh, uh, right hand corner, there's the little like uh, thing kind of looks like a screen icon. If you click on that, that's a way to get it to presenter mode. Yeah, I, okay, I, so. Hmm. I cannot get to that. We can share. We can share them if you'd rather. That's fine too. And then you can just say next slide. Oh well, let yeah, me we see. Okay. Um, if I do this, I just still get here. Uh, I think it works now. That that looks correct to me. Okay. Sorry about it's that. Accomplished. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, thank you for the invitation, you know, to give this talk and I have been listening and it's, uh, I think it's great uh, workshop uh, to organize uh, the, this topic. And I'm going to focus on more on the more fundamental part, uh, how, you know, people have mentioned how machine learning will help with uh, multimodal data. And so I will talk about the specific uh, approaches that we have developed on the uh, multimodal learning. Uh, so basically, uh, as you know, all of us have seen in the previous talks, uh, people have been integrating all different kinds of uh, modality data, and, and these are from different sources, uh, different uh, uh, sensors, especially currently there are all different sensors measuring all different kinds of data. And it's actually becoming a very critical issue how to integrate them. Um, so in the past, uh, you know, I you know from the previous talks showed uh, the integration of the multimodal data will help. We also have experiments to show on the uh, multi-omic data when we integrate uh, different modalities together, and you will see the. Uh, prediction of the samples 
increase significantly. Um, but the issue is how to integrate these different modalities. Uh, the challenge here, if you look at it, so the most important challenge, uh, I would say, is the missing part, missing data. Because in one uh, modality, you don't see that much. But when you combine different modalities, for example, you look at it here, and you will see modality, it's most of, you know, mostly very common. You will have missing data from different modalities uh, when you uh, combine them. So then how are you going to deal with this if you want to uh, fuse the data and, and uh, uh, for prediction or other, uh, other any research you want to do the follow up? So in the past, uh, people have uh, used the imputation. Uh, they have used uh, uh, most of these imputation. But now with the advanced machine learning models, uh, we really should look at how, uh, you know, beyond the imputation, how we are going to fuse different modalities uh, and to do a more effective uh, follow-up research for this. So that's what... Uh, uh, I am going to focus on. And uh, so this is part of an SF project funded for multi-model uh, learning for uh, uh, multi, uh, multiple uh, domain data with incomplete modalities. Um, so now, so what our approach is, is to, first of all, with the in, uh, input data, when you have different modalities with incompleteness, we want to be able to construct this data and to represent it in a way we can uh, avoid the missing part. And at the same time, we can handle each data represented in a unique way uh, uh, so we can uh, use the machine learning to process it. Uh, so people have used to deep learning or other kind of learning. You, you know, if you have data missing, you cannot uh, fit into the deep learning model. So you have to be able to represent in a way you can uh, fit into the model. So, uh, so graph model is a very popular uh, strategy to do that. So that's where uh, we propose to uh, model the uh, multi-modality data into a graph model, then we can use graph neural network to uh, map the data into an embedding representation for the follow-up research. Um, so to be more specific, how we will handle such, uh, you know, different modalities with a lot of incompleteness and into a, a graph model. That's the central part I want to talk about. So for example, here we have three modalities. And so with three modality, uh, you know, all different combinations, so you will have, uh, you know, seven different uh, uh, kind of pattern, right? Uh, with different missing, different missing. So you have seven different patterns. So with more modality, so normally you may have hundreds of modalities. Then the missing part becomes more complex. So you will have more uh, combinations or the patterns. So that's what I hope to show with this slide. So when we deal with missing data, we can convert, uh, treat this as different patterns with each different kind of mission. So with that, uh, uh, you, you can work, uh, so you have different patterns. So then each sample, for example, this patient one has only one modality and two other modality are missing. So this is a one kind of node, we call it the hyper node, but it's a one kind of pattern. And then the patient two have a different uh, missing and will have a different uh, 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 patterns. So, so this is another hy hyper node. So, you, so each node is represented as a different hyper node uh, with different modality it contains. So uh, I hope that's understandable. So with that, you can represent each data with a unique hypernode 
without this, uh, you know, you don't have to impute, uh, impute uh, the missing data. So then uh, we got the nodes and then we have to uh, establish the links between the nodes. So the hyper eight edges we establish is uh, calculating the similarity between the different hyper nodes with the each modality's similarity. So uh, for example, uh, this node uh, has two links to this one, to this one, because MRI image has uh, uh, has a, a MRI image in the, this node and MRI image in this node. So you will calculate the different uh, uh, similarity. And if it's above threshold, that's very similar, then you will establish a link. So that uh, uh, is called hyperlink. So you will link different nodes with hyperlink. So for example, this one has uh, uh, the second modality and third modality, it will link to this one and to this one. So I hope it's understandable that way we can convert the multimodal uh, data uh, with incompleteness in, into a, a heterogeneous hyper uh, node graph this way. So we don't have to deal with the imputation of missing data. So after we represent this in a graph, then it comes to the issue how you're going to handle this in machine learning algorithms. So it becomes the graph model and the input into, so we, we, in machine learning, you normally map the original data into a embedding space, which is just a vector space. And then you will do a follow up or a follow up research, for example, prediction, or other uh, decision making. So how do we do this? So basically, uh, this is a purely machine learning and nothing to do with domain anymore. So basically you have different modality that you can convert into a uh, vector space. Uh, with each modality, you may have images, you can use a CNN, a convolutionary uh, neural network. You may use other kind of neural network if it's a texture, uh, data. So different uh, modality can map into a, a, a unique space. And then with that, uh, this is just modality. But each hyperlink, uh, remember what I said here, you have an interaction between the uh, different modalities inside of a hyperlink. With that, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we, we can use the uh, embeddings to, uh, to catch that using the neural network to generate embeddings for the interactions between the features. So in the end, uh, uh, with each hyperlink, you will be able to convert into an internal space uh, with the, uh, the, the node uh, representation and also the interactions between the modalities inside the node. So for example, this node, uh, uh, has three different modalities. So not only it has a, a embedding for the node, it also has interactions between the nodes, which are catched, uh, caught by the embeddings inside. So this is what, you know, AI machine learning is very advanced now. We can do all this, uh, uh, you know, automatically in the system. So. After that, you have the internal nodes and you have the hypergraph, right? So then it becomes a very, uh, you know, technical uh, neural network uh, uh, issue of how to convert this graph into embedding space. So, uh, which I will not talk uh, uh, very detail, but on the high level, we can in, uh, convert this uh, a uh, heterogeneous graph, which is a hyperlink, uh, the graph into a homogeneous graph with uh, each node uh, is embedding and the uh, connections uh, are also uh, uh, interpreted in the embedding space as uh, whether they are near or far uh, with the embedding space. Okay, so that's how you can, uh, so basically represent your uh, multi-model uh, 
you know, data into a embedding space, uh, catching all the features between modalities in a machine learning uh, uh, space and to do follow up research. So, so in that way, you don't have to do uh, imputation. Uh, and, and so how this works, uh, does this work? So the experiments here shows, um, although this uh, data set is more on the object uh, recognition, not really on different uh, modality in the um, uh, uh, biomedical data, because we, in that paper publish, uh, published, uh, we, we need to compare with the state of art and baseline. And so they all use this data set, so we have to use that. So basically we have all this data set, which has a huge uh, number of classes in each data set to recognize the object faces. And they have all have different uh, modality. So in this case, we use the two modalities. <clears throat> so the objects has a different, fit, different uh, way to catch their uh, uh, image. So combining different, uh, uh, modalities together, and we we uh, showed here with the complete data, only the complete data, and, and what the performance is, and then randomly dropping 30%, 45%, 60%, and 70, 75% how uh, each different model works. So you can see our model uh, can work very well, uh, even dropping the 75% of the data uh, in, in the uh, in the experiments. And you can see with the data missing, uh, gradually increasing to higher ratio, and then you will see the drop of uh, accuracy. <clears throat> so that's uh, understandable how uh, different uh, uh, approaches work. And you can see all the other approaches actually imp imputate zeros into the missing data. So, uh, and that shows how this approach works. So uh, that's basically, I hope to introduce how uh, using advanced machine learning, we do can, uh, you know, fuse different modalities, but without using imputation data, and we can actually uh, make a, a new representation for the complex data set uh, to uh, represent the complex data. So I will not go to more details, but you can see this uh, paper we presented in the top uh, data mining conference, KDD 2020. And we also have a project on multimodal machine learning for data with incomplete modalities. So this uh, uh, has been worked, uh, you know, applied to different uh, domains and to show how effective the approach can be. So I will end here. Uh, and so I, I think, uh, you know, uh, in summary, the multimodal uh, fusion can be achieved in graph structure, and uh, as I shown. Uh, uh, so it, it is effective. And by modeling data in graph, we can deal with heterogeneous uh, modalities with incompleteness. And this shows effectiveness. And we also have worked on uh, the uh, in di distributed cases. So you have different missing data, and this approach can also apply. So I will stop there. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. I think um, I look forward to the discussion about you know not just fusion of data, but also fusion of machine learning and AI elements, right? Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot going on there um, that I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about. So um, thank you again. I want to introduce before the discussion, um, our, our our third speaker, uh, Dr. Heidi Hansen. Um, Dr. Hansen is a group lead of the Biostatistics and Multiscale Systems Modeling Group in the Computational or Com Computing and Computational Sciences Directorate at Oak Ridge. Um, her research is focused on disentangling the interactions of genetic and environmental influences on disease risk throughout the life course, and she aims to link her findings to clinical measures that can be used to improve precision strategies for screening and treatment. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome yeah, Dr. Hansen. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, and I'm honored to be here to present to you today. Um, so I'm going to start off my slideshow uh, with 
this question, uh, the power of large multimodal biomedical data. And I have a question there, question mark there for a reason. And the reason is, is a lot of the algorithms we're talking about are super data hungry um, and they don't always transport well into other scenarios. And so this is the vision that we'd really like to have where we can follow an individual over their life course, collect as much data as possible so that we can identify who's at risk for disease early on and treat them. And then not only stop uh, following them at that point in time, but really follow them through the course of treatment. Um, but to do this well, it takes a lot of data and to do this well across many different diverse communities, it takes thinking about things uh, from more than just the perspective of a single place. So this is just a look into some of the projects that we have going on um, at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. One of them is a partnership with Cincinnati Children's Health. And we are working with them to build a model for anxiety trajectories for children. And that model should, the goal of that model is to have something that's rolled out into the clinic, can identify children at an early stage of anxiety diagnosis so that they can jump, the doctors can jump in and help treat them. We also have similar projects ongoing with the Veterans Administration um, and then one with the National Cancer Institute that I'm going to talk about in just a little bit. But you can see there's lots of data available. When we start to combine it with the environmental data sets, we get even uh, more data, which is exciting, a little bit overwhelming. Um, and thinking about how we deal with that it is still a question that we are dealing with um, but this study is designed just for Cincinnati Children's Health, and we're using data just for Cincinnati Children's Health. I'm going to walk you today through something more of the infrastructure that I'm very excited about, not that I'm not excited about that, that study, um, but how can we start to think forward so that we're making sure that as we're designing these things, they have the ability to scale up. And can we start really thinking in a way that allows us to design early on so that we can talk, studies can talk to each other um, and really start to build a full population health models rather than just models that are specific to different clinics. And I know that's a hard question and I'm, we're not going to be able to solve it in a day, a week, a couple of years, but I'd really uh, have been thinking about how we can do this in a more broad uh, population level way. So what's required to do this? Well, I'm gonna talk not a lot about this. Uh, we have a lot of compute at Oak Ridge, but probably our biggest uh, advantage is we have a spot where there's strong interdisciplinary team science. So when we talk about multimodal data, we're talking about omics, we're talking about imaging, we're talking about the environmental exposure part, electronic health data, the person who knows all of those things really well uh, is brilliant. And most of us maybe don't quite hit that level, but we're still brilliant, but not, not quite that level. So in order to do this very well, we need folks that are experts, not only on the compute side, in the domain, but they have domain expertise and expertise in their own specific problem set to be able to come together, talk about what it means to really do multimodal data analytics and what kind of things should they we be thinking about so that the algorithms that we come up with aren't biased and don't have issues um, when we actually roll them out into the clinic. So I'm going to walk you through a use case. This is a, um, a collaboration that we have with the National Cancer Institute. It's mo called the Mosaic Project, modeling outcomes using surveillance data and scalable artificial intelligence for cancer. And the reason I picked this project to highlight is because it actually is one of our biggest projects that is truly a population level. So the data that we have uh, to, to work on this project is coming from the surveillance epidemiology and end results registries. So if you don't know what those are, SEER registries are across the US. They cover approximately 47% of the, or 48% of the population. Um, and they collect all data within their catchment areas on cancer. So anything that has to do with that cancer incidence uh, data, is being collected by a SEER registry. They're also involved in the National Childhood Cancer Registry. So through that partnership, we get information on imaging, information on omics and electronic health records. So we're collecting a lot of data on cancer. And by we, I mean uh, the partnership NCI is actually doing the data collection. At Oak Ridge, the data that we're training on includes data from Louisiana, Kentucky, Utah, Seattle, New Jersey, New Mexico, and California. 
We train our algorithms using that data, and then we test it using the full SARE data. And um, basically what we're doing right now, and I, I am going to walk you through some of the architecture types of things because these problems are so big, is we are extracting information from unstructured data using large language models. Um, we take pathology reports, which is what you see on the right-hand side, and we basically extract the information that SEER needs to be able to do their cancer reporting. So we categorize site, subsite, histology, laterality, and behavior. The reason that I'm pointing this out is right now, this is rolled out in production uh, at the national level. So these algorithms um, are used on a daily basis in SEER and SEER DMS. We have built in um, basically uncertainty quantification. So we're talking about health space, which means we're high risk. And our algorithms are always going to give us an answer. Whether or not we can trust that answer is a question that we should be asking. If we're talking about rolling things out into the clinic, if we're talking about a causation, we can deal with that in a, a, dip, a bit of a different way for thinking epidemiological studies. But really, truly translational science that we're rolling out needs to incorporate uncertainty quantification. So what we do is we built that in. We don't uh, predict on reports that we don't trust. We set the bar very high at a 98% accuracy across all data elements. And then um, we predict on those ones that we trust. And so right now across the US, we're able to take a report and predict 17, uh, those are interesting percentages that I need to fix, but uh, we, we basically report, report somewhere around 23 to 27 uh, percent of path reports uh, across the U.S. So we can take that information rapidly, phenotype those cases, and then we use that information for downstream tasks. Um, and that's the part that's really important here is that we can extract information from one modality uh, and then we can actually use that information for downstream tasks if we need the interpretability there. As was uh, talked about in some of the other talks, we can also use the embeddings for that. But this gives us that intermediate step if we want interpretability. So I'm not going to get super into the details of some of the things that we're doing, but outside of the large language model that we have in production, we are working on foundational models. And the reason this is exciting is we can take all of the data that we have pre-train, and then we can predict on many different types of tasks. So basically, we come up with one foundational model that's specific to pathology reports, and we can start to predict on many different tasks which is a domain shift from what was done before where I train one model for every single task that I'm doing. It saves on compute, it makes us uh, more flexible, and it also allows us to do what we are trying to do right now. So we're partially in the uh, building part of this infrastructure. This is the vision for it. So essentially what we are trying to do now is can we build a library of foundational models? So what I mean by that is we have all these different modalities. Can we start to build these foundational models that can be used on imaging data, pathology data, clinical text data, survey data, uh, social network data to have those embeddings already pre-trained and then start to predict different tasks and combine them in ways uh, that are specific to the study at hand or the prediction model at hand. So right now we're in the stage of building some of these, uh, these models. And so we hope that this will allow us to scale to different types of questions across the US and make something more reproducible um, and replicable. So I talked a lot about what we're doing on the BOM information extraction side from electronic health data. Now I'm going to talk about the fact that SEER is also linked to residential history data, which is super exciting to me. So uh, what they have is linkages uh, for from LexisNexis across 11 of their SEER registries right now. There should be 15 SEER registries by the end of the year. This means we have for those same pathology reports that we have records for, we have 3.2 million uh, records with uh, residential history. And that residential history goes back to, uh, it goes back to 80, but it's high quality from 1995 to 2020. Uh, and 83% of those records are geocoded at the point location. So we're working with NCI to start linking to these three data sets first, indoor radon exposure, RSEI microdata and air pollution data, so that other folks can start to do uh, research using this information. And the way that we're doing this, and this is uh, this is going to be, I'm going to walk you through how we're doing this 
but it's applicable across many different data sets that we're trying to collect in our environmental health data repository. Essentially, we are using Uber H Hexes. Um, the reason that we chose Uber H Hexes is we can take that point information or we can take polygon information. We can overlay that information with a fishnet of hexes, and then we can extract the information that we need. Um, so one example of this is with RSEA microdata. So we took RSEA microdata, overlaid Uber H hexes on top of that. Then we were able to summarize what the value was within that Uber H hex. The beautiful thing about Uber H hexes is you can scale them based on population size. So what you see on the right side is the bigger hexes have smaller populations and we need to scale out to, so that we don't have to deal with privacy issues. So we make those hexes large in spaces where there's very little population so that we can scale to the level that we need to to protect privacy. In urban areas uh, that are like here, they're really, really small. Um, and that allows us to get specific in the types of exposure areas that we are looking at. So that's an example with the uh, RSCI data, but what we're actually doing is doing is we're dropping those hexes over every single data set that we have so that we can start to build an external ex exposome measure that we can stack on top of each other and measure as many different things uh, as we can and start to describe all of the milieu of what you're exposed to in the environment. Um, the other thing that we do is we drop a population mask over that. So we use land scan data, um, which identifies where populations reside. That way we can throw out information where nobody's living um, and get rid of it and only store information uh, that we actually need based on where populations are living. The other beautiful thing that allows us to do is it allows us to assess missingness. So this is what you're looking at on the right-hand side is from individual home radon test kits. And there is a selection bias into what we actually see here. So in order for us to get a test kit, someone has to put it in their home test, which means certain areas or certain populations may not have testing in their home. We may assume that they don't have high rate on exposure, but it may purely be for the fact that we don't get those measures. The population uh, mask allows us to identify areas in green here where populations live, but no testing is happening. And those may be targeted areas or things that we need to think about in our modeling. Um, let's see. Then again, similar to what we're doing with the uh, electronic health data is we're building basically libraries of models that we can use for downstream tasks. So libraries of foundational models for environmental exposures. And this includes behavioral, social data, and chemical exposure data that then we can pick and pull to create our multimodal models and also combine together for looking at disease risk. So yeah. This is a, a question I get asked a lot is like, that's great and all, um, you're doing some of this for Mosaic, but how does it apply to the rest of us? And this is a part that I'm really, really passionate about is making sure that what we're designing is reproducible, replicable and usable for real world applications. So at the project level, what we are doing is making sure that all of our code from start to end, so data processing pipelines, uh, actual code for the models is publicly facing and available so that folks can run things in the exact same way that we are running things. And that's one way to get to that scalable population level uh, models that I talked about. The other way that we're kind of thinking about doing this is federated learning. And so we have, uh, with the same project that we're doing, we're setting up federated learning runs. Everything on the electronic health is cross silo, lots of data, one center. Um, and we're basically playing around with the privacy accuracy trade-offs that are required in a federated learning space so that we can enable folks to participate in some of these runs that historically have not been able to because they don't have the compute power or they aren't able to uh, because of data use agreements. I'm not gonna dig into all the things that are there. Uh, there's a lot that actually goes into that, but it's an exciting direction that actually will, mm. in my opinion, allow us to scale up to the population level. And I will stop there. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, I admit to, you know, some jealousy over computational resources sometimes when I see uh, Ornal folks present. I know you all share a lot of stuff. And I think the last slide addressed some of my questions about, you know, how do we get at this stuff, right? Because it's fascinating. 
Um, so I do want to invite um, the uh, three presenters um, to uh, turn on their cameras um, for some panel discussion here. Um, and there, I know Dr. Patel's in the room, um, in the actual room there, um, so it might not be doable. Um, but I, I feel like the presentations that we just saw, we actually did a fantastic job of meeting that first session obje objective of actually presenting people with use cases and studies where they can see this, right? So I think we've covered that really well, and I hope people follow up with the speakers if you have questions on those. I did want to ask kind of the second objective is um, some thoughts about how AI and ML can be used in, in, in a pipeline, and maybe even thinking about what a pipeline is, right? And I think maybe Dr. Zhang or, or Patel can comment first, because um, I think clearly, um, you know, the Mosaic project is, I, I would call that a pipeline, right? It's it's things are being watched, um, you know, there, there's automated learning, you know, how, how do we turn some of these other things into what we might consider more of a, of a pipeline? Yeah, uh, yeah maybe I can start with, uh, that's a very good uh, question uh, in the application. You can see from the presentation he, uh, Heidi just gave, you know, there are a lot of different modalities and sensors and you, you have to uh, integrate them. So I think the integration is the most important uh, part. And uh, uh, I do believe the uh, advanced machine learning approach can help uh, uh, the best uh, we can comparing with the other approaches to integrate in the pipeline. And by doing that integration, a lot of issues need to be resolved. But one of the, like I said, you know, how do we integrate data when they have missingness and also heterogeneity, right? The other part I did not mention is so heterogeneity. All different data have different, uh, you know, uh, different models. So how do you integrate them? I, I think this uh, really need the, the machine learning approaches to, to do the job. So if I may add to that, David, I think there's a couple of things that uh, need to be put into place or are uh, able to do right now in terms of building pipelines. The first are access to uh, clinical data that are linked to potentially some of these biobanks that we're already collecting. So you can imagine a scenario in which you run a process, some multimodal AI to develop your algorithm or to do some sort of discovery, and which is linked to electronic health records where you can then perspectively evaluate some of these methods uh, on real patient data or even call back individuals for to, to develop some sort of uh, AI-based uh, intervention all in, in sort of a electronic health records uh, scenario. The second thing is I think we need, and I, I think our speakers touch on this, are, are libraries of models, if you will. So we have li libraries of data. I think one thing is to make them also accessible, as we heard in, a, uh, in our fantastic last talk here by Dr. Hansen, make them available so that others can quickly evaluate them. And for that, that would, would require data standards um, it, it to, be, to be agreed on so that we can it, uh, implement them on, you know, uh, for example, all of us to UK Biobank, uh, to electronic health record setting, et cetera, in real time evaluate all these model performances across different cohort uh, data. Yeah, I, I think, you know, one before we, um, you know, there's a, a, a good chat question that I want to get to. Um, but, I, you know, on the little bit of the pipeline thing, I think something I saw, you know, certainly in your presentation, uh, Dr. Patel, would be the idea of, you know, if we're building a pipeline, um, some of these studies are also life course, right? So we saw in you know, Dr. Zhang's presentation as well, right? You know, had, you know, we're predicting things for for different stages and, and modalities of people's lives. So in a pipeline sense, what does that mean, right? Because we you'll have a the a model for today, um, but then that same corpus of data, right? That's those same cohort of people, I'm sorry. Um, we need to ask questions about them tomorrow. You know, so what is, the, in terms of a pipeline, what does that mean? Are we constantly updating outputs or are we offering interpretations or, or how does that work for actually communicating these things? Yeah, th that's actually a very good question. That's, uh, you know, uh, if people have heard shift, right? The domain shift, uh, you know, over the time, the domain changes all the time. How are you going to, uh, build uh, your model will will be able to generalize 
to all to the domain shifts in this sense. I think that is a, a major, major topic in machine learning community to deal with that. Uh, and I think it's still an open problem. How do you deal with the domain shifts? Yeah, it's still, I, I would agree with that. That's a great answer. And it's still very much a, an open problem. Some of the things that we've started to do is build in temporal checks. So basically we're we're assessing temporal drift as we, we go forward in time. And that's part of our profiling. So not only do we have data profiling, but we have model profiling where we're assessing different types of biases or temporal shift in the data. And then that might inform what how we make decisions about how frequently we update it. But it's really trying to think about things as rather than a single endpoint, but a, 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 the full pipeline and, and an iterative pipeline where you're constantly checking, reassessing, and, and, and updating things. Yeah, I think that'll be especially relevant for, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Calcutt. Oh, sorry. Sorry, David. I just wanted to add too that. Um... It, you know, many of these modalities may be redundant. And so one sort of experiment one needs to do is understand the correlations between them. I think Dr. Balshaw mentioned that the hyper correlation between exposures. So it could be that some of these modalities are simply repeated information and that you don't need to measure that. And uh, you can implement a sparse sort of uh, a set of measures to, to get the, capture the same amount of variance explained. And I think, you know, as kind of a, segue into the next question, right? We're all doing this in the face of climate change, right? So, you know, clearly all of our, uh, uh, you know, the environment is not static, right? We know that and not just talking about pollution, but, you know, all of it gets affected. So, you know, you know, on that, um, like as a segue here, the, the chat question, you know, do we have suggestions for dealing with the need for privacy and spatially heterogeneous environmental contamination data um, that can be associated with localized exposure patterns, right? We saw, I think that Dr. Hansen's presentation, some idea about spatial joining and, and how to, you know, scale up and down there. But, you know, do folks have thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, that's a very interesting question. And it's a very good one. And one that folks don't always catch on to is the fact that when you start to combine all these modalities, you really run into privacy issues. So I, I may de-identify my health data but then I join it to some sort of information about environmental exposure at a small spatial extent, maybe 1km, 1km. And then those patterns become very unique to that space in some cases, right? And so I went through all this work to de-identify. I joined it to an environmental exposure and hey, I have an identifiable information in a way I didn't really think about. So I would say uh, there are, I think that there are ways we can start to think about making sure that these are privacy protected. Asking these questions is, is a very good first step. So a lot of the things in the privacy, privacy space haven't been really well quantified. So at what level do I need to think about this? At what happens when I get to certain patterns? I think we need more research into that sort of question asking um, or critical thought. Uh, I also think that we need to start to think about other methods, and that's kind of why I'm I'm interested in the federated learning spaces. At some point, when we're talking multimodal data, it's going to it's always easy to triangulate a person. So we need to think about other ways to deal with this. So can it be privacy preserving federated learning? Can it be? Um, there's always going to have to be IRB, DUA sorts of things, but can we start to get innovative in, in the ways that we're processing this data would be my answer or question. Yeah, and maybe I can add uh, the other aspect uh, of the question on the contaminated data. So, uh, you know, machine learning goes very advanced in this uh, other serial learning, if you have heard of other serial mm -hmm. learning. So, and I think that's a similar approach, you know, contaminated kind of fake data or uh, similar to those. So adversarial learning and also generative AI has gone, uh, you know, advanced to data augmentation to try to uh, solve, to reduce such problems. So I think that we do have a future on that. Yeah, and I think as we go back to the, um, you know, it, from the the first session too, um, some of the questions about you know the the dangers of 
de-identifying folks and and having you know biases built into our um, you know our, our our models. I think that the map you showed, you know, Dr. Hansen was forty eight percent of the country, um, but they were certainly geographically contiguous, right? You know, they're like tranches, right? Like three tranches across the country, and I think a lot of cohorts end up looking like that, right? And so you're gonna if you're not um, building out at the beginning, it's going to get big. And if we don't think about the de-identifying things, um, you know, you're going to end up with some of those non-desirable outcomes about where the learners bias themselves. Um, so it, I'm sorry, Dr. Patel, do you have something? I'm sorry, Mike. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank uh, you very uh, much. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> David, yes, I just wanted to comment on um, Heidi's um, so uh, everyone did a great job. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. Um, but Heidi, yes, that was a great trick uh, or or um, the methodology with regard to using um, Landscan, right, um, to derive um, without crosswalks. You are now at a what, a one, basically a one, almost two kilometer um, level in terms of, uh, yeah, your um, aggregation there. Um, so without a gridded data set, generally you would link, you know, MODIS, we do that, you know, we use MODIS 2.3.5 and then link it to um, our public health exposed zone to be down near about that. And thank you for bringing those issues up. Uh, IRB really doesn't like to see that, <laughs> but, but um, I, I want to um, compliment you on that. And the reason why this is very, very important um, because the imputation in Columbus, I mean, you know, smart cities, smart and sustainable cities um, have to have monitoring, you know, throughout the city. Generally, these are purple air monitors, but generally these monitors aren't placed in communities, uh, vulnerable communities. Columbus didn't, so we got a grant to put them in those census tracts where they weren't and found out that we were almost an order of magnitude off in the imputation, um, Dr. Zhang, with respect to real versus <laughs> imputation. So I wanna caution us to be um, careful in that regard, but that was without AI or some sort of um, supervised clustering methodology, uh, Jerome, yeah. Mm -hmm. But hey, other than you, that- uh, Oh, I was just gonna ask Dr. Hood, are you, are you saying that those were placed with the the benefit of some learning model is where you guided your placement of those or they were placed based on just where you had missing data? Uh, just what we had missing data, which is always in vulnerable, low census to low socioeconomic um, status census tracts, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, well, maybe, you know, I'll ask as a follow-up to if maybe Dr., particularly I think Dr. Zhang um, might be able to comment on this of, of as you're doing these multimodal data and you're finding holes in the data, the missingness of the data, it seemed like your methods didn't really care about whether you had prior knowledge of of the the um you know anything about that particular data set like did i misinterpret that or is it beneficial if you're having exposomics data on one particular kind of contaminant that you sort of know a spatial pattern um you know with your graph embedding method is that actually adding information or is it can it just be um what's the right word agnostic to um to, to any sort of uh, prior idea about the nature of that missingness mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a very good question because in the past, uh, people have used prior knowledge to impute the data, right? And and sometimes they just simply use of the, the data to impute. So uh, in this approach I presented, uh, we try not to use those, but uh, we utilize the in interactions between the modalities. That's the key part because the why do you want to use a different modality? <clears throat> because they have interactions uh, and they have common uh, features you want to extract. So I think machine learning can extract those information uh, automatically from the data set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I may add, uh, David, to this, I think um, for certain critical questions, I think uh, we need to do be better at measuring. So I think several topics that emerged from the last session were about non-additive relationships between cumulative exposures or versus multiplicative effects. And I think that 
uh, while I'm very optimistic about imputation, I think eventually we need to measure everything such that they're non-missing. So we can really ask those questions about non-additive versus, uh, you know, additive relationships between exposures and, and, and health, health status. I, you know, I wonder if you have thoughts about your, um, I think you presented it as, a, I think the word you used was um, like an old method or traditional method. You're talking about a canonical correlation. Um, you know, this is a, an AI ML workshop and we're all pushing, you know, the methods throttle as fast as we can. Um, you know, but I wonder about like, you know, do you have some thoughts about the benefits of like for interpretation, maybe some methods that were around for a hundred years and just slow. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't want to speak for Venk, Murthy and David uh, and, uh, and Ravi, who are the authors of that paper. But I would say that th that was enabled because they had complete cases on both mm -hmm. the metabolomics and the dietary behavior. And you're right. They're able to get something that was easy to interpret and look at out uh, health outcomes with that. So I think, um, it, that matters and it adds to the impact of the things that we can we can do. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I would add that when you do integration or you look at the correlation, especially using machine learning models, you always face the interpretation problem. That's that's also one of the problems the machine learning community is trying to solve. <clears throat> I think we. <clears throat> We are optimistic to to have good solutions to do that. And maybe I'll just ask everyone if you know if, if you have a you know a closing thought as we're about time, you know, for the panelists, especially on that key piece of like you know going into the next sessions. Are there things we can do now to help interpretation? You know, are there like quick things that are are reachable right now? You know, that we can start doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I, I think, uh, you know, look at the, you know, like uh, it was mentioned, uh, comparing simple method to more advanced machine learning method. Now there's a trend going, whether more uh, advanced will, will help and with interpretability. So I think this is a very important topic uh, to have the balance between the two. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, I like that answer. I, it takes a little bit more time and we all are methods geeks a little bit. So we're all like, yeah, but it, I think it's a very important way to go forward. Um, I also think thinking about building uncertainty quantification in what we're building is extremely important. Again, kind of a, a hard space. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot there, a lot of open questions, but rather than just accepting what we're modeling, can we start to build an uncertainty quantification and then incorporate that into some of our pipelines? I think uh, those are, I, I also like those answers. I think enhancing our existing cohort data or our existing surveillance data, like the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, so that they do not have missing information so that we can build uh, baselines, for example, uh, when we do implement these uh, data or measurements, multimodal measurements in things like the, like all of us in biobank samples. So I'd say um, a baseline or uh, a baseline metrics to assess how we're doing. Yeah, well, thank you all. And I'll, I'll let the, you know, the, the thank you again to the speakers um, for everybody. I'll, I'll let you all have the last word. You've earned it. Um, and we'll now, I think, move into a lunch break and we're, um, set to reconvene at two. And I think we'll want to start exactly at two because um, right after that, you know, we have our, our keynotes and a, a visit from um, Rick Wojcik. So, you know, we'll want to make sure we start session three on time. So unless the organizers have any more comments, I think we're going to take a pause now um, and reconvene at two. Um, yeah, thank you all again to um, you know, all three. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we are going to start our session three. So the goal for the session three is to provide an overview for the emerging AI and ML methods, approaches for data integration and applications. Uh, we have three wonderful speakers today. And my name is Yao Yi Chang. I am an associate professor, at University of Minnesota. I'm in the computer science and engineering department. Uh, my, but my background is a mix of computer science and spatial sciences. I'm also a GIS professional. Um, my area of expertise is on spatial AI. So we work on applied machine learning methods, um, data mining methods, systems to look at different problems uh, that involve spatial data. All right, so without further ado, today our first speaker is Dr. Joyce Ho. So Dr. Joyce Ho is an associate professor in the computer science department at Emory University. Her research focuses on the development of novel data mining machine learning algorithms with problems in healthcare. Uh, she also had co-founded a successful healthcare analytic company. Um, so today we are going to hear from her about her work. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. So today I'm gonna to talk about the integration of novel data streams to capture neighborhood level measures. And to start this off, I really wanna motivate it from the perspective of health equity and, and sort of take a case study, which is to think about heart failure. Now, it's well known that social determinants of health and neighborhood really have this effect, this unknown effect, right? And it's unclear exactly why it is. So if you look at existing literature, what you'll see for heart failure and for uh, peripheral artery disease is that there's conflicting evidence of whether or not neighborhood deprivation index actually plays a role in this. And given this, you might say, well, maybe there is no neighborhood effect. Uh, but what our premise is, is basically deprivation in indices really fail to fully capture the neighborhood or community factors. And so the real question that we want to think about is, how can you get at these factors without asking the patient, without burdening healthcare providers. So what we thought is that you in fact can tap into novel data streams that are already publicly accessible, you know, people create. And so I'm gonna cover four different ones that we're quite interested in thinking about. So the first one you can think of as market segmentation data. This, this would be things like Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter. Another one is thinking about geodata services. So this would be Google Places, Foursquare, Yelp, and OpenStreetMap. Another one might be mobility data that's covered, you know, so for Atlanta, we have MARTA. But really thinking about Department of Transportation and Apple Maps and Google Maps uh, as, as proxies for mobility. And then there's also community-based forms. So this would be things like patient like me, patient.info, Nextdoor, and even thinking about Reddit. Now, these are all already publicly available to some extent. They all have APIs that you can sort of get at the data uh, and users are already posted. So it's not something that we necessarily need to collect. So the question is, does it do better? And so we went about to answer this uh, by thinking about prototyping new neighborhood measures. So in particular, we focused on three different sources of data. This is gonna be Twitter. So you can see that in the middle, an example of a tweet. Uh, we also thought about Foursquare, which has, you know, thinking about groceries in New York. And we've also been thinking about OpenStreetMaps, which is, you know, curated by the, the public, essentially. Now, for Foursquare and OpenStreetMaps, what we're looking at is the points of interest within the census tract. And we're focusing on census tract because you have to validate against something. Uh, and the natural ones that are typically used when thinking about health equity is census tract level. Now for our Twitters, we've also been thinking about, well, how many of them are geotagged with specific keywords? And we're gonna focus only on six categories of interest. Uh, and these are the ones that we sort of curated initially because there's been some literature to support that there is some effects thinking about these. So these would be the number of parks that you live nearby, right? So recreation, uh, thinking about pharmacies. So how readily available is medication? Grocery, so do you live in a food desert? And as a proxy, that would also be restaurants. Uh, we also looked at sports, right? So sports teams, sporting events, things like that. Um, 
And then we are also thinking about health as well. So looking at healthcare access. So we looked at this and what I'm showing you are three measures, our own uh, area deprivation index, which is commonly used by CMS today. Uh, and then also social deprivation index, which has also been commonly used across different literature. Now, what you'll notice is that from the six categories of this very simplistic approximation of neighborhood, we in fact can improve whether or not a patient will come back in 30 days over 31,000 plus heart failure patients admitted to the Emory healthcare system by almost 10% improvement, right? Which we think is really exciting. So this suggests that in fact, you know, ADI and SDI both may not capture neighborhood or community factors well. We really want to think about how we can get at better data. Oh, and somehow I jumped off. Sorry, it seems a bit unstable. Uh, somehow I don't like the internet here, so I'll, I'll try to I'll tether to my hotspot. Uh, give me one sec. Sorry about this. I don't know if uh, my phone will be any better. Yeah, sure, if you don't mind, if I can use a clicker that also works as well. I'm, I'm pretty agnostic. I think I was on slide five. Yeah, so, you know, thinking about this, we actually delved into the six categories a bit more. And you'll see it along the six dimensions. And interestingly enough, even if we adjust for patient characteristics, so this is looking at age, gender, comorbidities, uh, what we found was that, uh, if you can advance one, uh, we found that pharmacy and grocery actually have pr protective associations. So that means that if you live near more pharmacies and more grocery stores in the census tract, you are less likely to be readmitted in 30 days. Um, and whereas surprisingly, well, at least for me, restaurants have a negative hazardous uh, association with 30 day readmission. So somehow if you lived near more restaurants, you actually were more likely to come back in. Surprising. But what can we do with this data, right? What can we do this, with this information? Uh, we've been thinking about how you can pilot pharmacy interventions. So the idea is that if you don't live near pharmacies in a census tract that's not nearby, uh, maybe what we can think about doing is doing a meds to bed program where we send pharmaceuticals to them, or we think about, you know, sending someone out there and making sure that they're taking their medications and have that. Now, in thinking about this a little bit further, uh, you know, what we also want to consider is how can we actually do better, right? So this is with very coarse measurements. Uh, surprisingly, restaurants is not better. And we really couldn't understand why, because our intuition was, if you lived in a food desert, right, that would mean that you aren't anywhere near restaurants. Now, it seems the opposite is true. So we dug into some of these census tracts. And what we discovered is that fast food restaurants are the prevalence, right? Um, and so that motivated us toward this next idea of how can we actually get at more fine-grained measures? So as an example, we might think of healthcare facilities, uh, we might talk about it differently. So if you don't mind advancing to the next slide, what we've been thinking about is how you can actually do human guided uh, category refinement. And what I'm gonna show you is a use case on one of the six categories. I'm, we're looking at it in the context of health. Um, and we, we're looking at Twitter in particular because Twitter tends to be unstructured data. So we wanted to say, well, how you pre-process the data, right? Uh, how you maybe think about topics that are emerging in the tweets are the things that we want to consider. And in thinking about that, we really want the domain expert to come help us guide these clusters or these refinements because for every category we're going to think about, uh, you really want it to, you know, sort of reflect some some notion, right? Or at least maybe potentially improve it. And so if you click on the next one, 
uh, what we discover, uh, what we've done in the interactive under the hood uh, is that we've developed this unsupervised machine learning model that can take these tweets, extract keywords, get at the representations or the embeddings, right? So we're sort of agnostic to any big changes in the natural language processing world, thinking about large language models, they're sort of plug and play for us. Uh, what we've developed is this mechanism to figure out, well, how do I learn word representations where I push similar words together in the space uh, and to distinguish dissimilar words? And what this allows us to do is identify topics that might make more sense. So if you click on the next, what I'm now going to show you, right, is a comparison of SDI. If we looked at just the health score in terms of Twitter, you'll notice that it does a little bit better. Now, if we just do you know, this topic refinement without human guided annotations, you'll notice that we are in fact not any better than SDI. But if we go through this iterative process of defining and pushing keywords that make sense together, we in fact can do a little bit better, right? And so this is you know, an example of how I think human domain knowledge can help guide these refinements. But also in the process when we've been thinking about this, right, is that we've been treating each data stream as separate, right? And in fact, every data stream is likely to be correlated with one another. So when we've been thinking about the pharmacy one, what we did is we pulled the Georgia Board of Pharmacy list. And what we found is that there was very little congruence between our data and the pharmacy data. Uh, and so if you advance to the next slide, what we really wanna think about is how we can match any two objects between different data sources. Now, traditionally in the computer science domain, this is known as entity matching. Uh, so if you look at these two entities, right? One is from Zomato, which is you know years ago, and one is from Yelp. Would you say that these two are the same? And based on, right, yes, right, it's clear to us that these are the same. Uh, this is what's an integral portion of database, right? And it's very well studied in database. Now, if you click one more. One of the biggest problems with current models, machine learning models that are trained on this task is that in fact, these models assume the two data sources share the exact same columns, right? So someone's gone ahead and aligned the databases. And then someone's gone ahead and cleaned the, the values as well. So you can imagine this is actually a lot of work. Uh, and so if you click on the next one, I'm gonna show you what it looks like originally, right? In the pure original data, because real data is messy. Real data is ugly, right? Things are not gonna align and we cannot expect that we wanna pay the price of manually annotating thousands and thousands of these to get at which pharmacies are really true and which ones are not. So if you click to the next slide, please. What we, so what I'm showing you now is four common benchmark data sets. Uh, so version one is the original benchmark data set that has been cleaned, has been standardized. Version four is to take the original data set as it is without any cleaning. And this is an existing state of the art model using large language models. Okay. So what you'll notice in fact is there is a significant degradation in accuracy, right? In fact, if you look at the last two lines, it's really terrible. So if you click on the next one, what we've developed recently is this new deep learning model that really learns nonlinear relationships between column names and values. And the idea is that we can learn which columns we should really focus on, which values are the ones that really matter. Uh, and if you click one more time, what I'm gonna show you is the results from our model, right? And what you'll notice is that because we're thinking about this from the perspective of real world data, right? We're really modeling interactions across the columns and the attributes. Uh, you'll see that we actually have a relatively stable performance. Uh, there is obviously gonna be a performance drop, right? As you could tell, it was a much harder problem, but in fact, it's, it's not terrible, right? It's actually fairly usable. So last set of slides. So hopefully what I convinced you of today, right, is that really we can think about these new data streams and thinking about integrating them in, right, beyond the traditional environment. Uh, we really wanna think about how you incorporate human interactions to get at these better fine-grained metrics. 
And then really, when we're thinking about these data integration models, these entity matching that we want to do, we really should train it on real world and messy data sets, not on the clean ones that we assume will do well. And with that, I'm going to, if you click two more times, uh, thank my collaborators and my students who have made this all possible, and obviously NSF, NIH, and j, &J. Thank you, Dr. Ho. Our next speaker is Dr. Thomas Harton. So Dr. Thomas Harton is the chair for evidence-based toxicology in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He also have a joint appointment at the Whiting School of Engineering. And he also have affiliation with the Georgetown University. And he is also a consulting vice president of Exosim in New Orleans. So without further ado, Dr. Houghton. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, this time from Germany, from the University of Constance, where I just gave a lecture. <laughs> okay, um, my slides I have made available. I will show the QR code at the on the last slide again. Um, I think for this discussion important, I'm also the field chief editor of Frontiers in Artificial Intelligence, so I share a very general interest um, in AI. Next slide, please. We see at the moment um, the synergy of three elements, um, the increase in data, the increase in computer power, and the increase in our AI algorithm. Our data are increasing by more than 60% every year data in the world, so which means more than 90% of all data in the world have been produced in the last two to three years. Um, Moore's law gave us over the last 60 years uh, a doubling in computer capacity every second year. But AI for the last decade has been doubling in capacity every three months. And altogether next, uh, this led to about a billion fold increase in the computational power of these systems over the 60 years of my lifetime. Next. Um, and this is leaving nothing unaffected. Um, it's no longer the, yeah, the world as we know it. Um, and this includes also environmental health and toxicology, as I want to show you in the next slides, please. Um, we have seen that on P-Day, uh, the 14th of March, uh, GPT-4 was released, and it is now outperforming most human tasks, um, whether this is a simulated bar exam of a lawyer, an SAT, um, these are astonishingly powerful models as everybody is witnessing at the moment. Next. Um, what we see is that over time, uh, something is happening that we have moved to deep learning with which the AI really became powerful. And we're moving at the moment to deep reinforcement learning, which has made these tremendous um, um, possibilities happen. And now we are increasingly also um, further working with distributed agents. Um, so not just one central computer doing the entire job. Next, a very strong feature of this is the so-called foundation models. Foundation models are now these big models like um, ChatGPT. Um, and these models are no longer trained for one specific task, but they allow us to fine tune them, use them as a foundation and add our problems to the body of work, which has been done in the past. And um, they especially are being trained on what is called multimodal data, which means they are using pictures, they're using videos, they're using text, speech, and all of these together and this is the basis of um, the current um, foundation models. Next. Um, yeah, you choose uh, Lewis Carroll. Uh, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. And in fact, um, several things I would have called impossible a few years ago have happened in a recent time. Next, please. For example, number one, um, Alpha Zero showed us that without ever studying a human game, Within eight hours, um, um, Alpha Zero is playing so far better than any human 
and so different than any human that human players now study how chess could be played more effectively. And there's several others. Um, just to mention, while in 2020, there was no uh, AI-designed drug in clinical trials, in 2022, there's already 18 AI-first drugs in clinical trials at the moment. And you can uh, marvel at some of the others um, independently. Next. Um, in toxicology and safety sciences, environmental health, um, there is, from my point of view, a very strong need for such type of technologies to revamp um, what astonishingly has not changed um, for long. Most of the methods we are using in regulatory toxicology have been introduced when I was not yet born or in kindergarten. Um, I had the privilege to lead for the Department of Defense um, a Future Directions workshop. Um, I found two co-chairs with Alana Vaz Asien from Colombia and Vaishu Shishu from Texas AM. And with 30 um, avant-gardistic toxicologists and 15 agency observers next, uh, we published uh, two weeks ago um, this workshop, this document, which is in essence a call for human exposome project. But next, um, it has three pillars. Um, and uh, I already described them in this paper earlier this, uh, this year. Next, please. And these three pillars are um, to make toxicology, back please, uh, more exposure driven, technology enabled, and here AI is one of this, the core technologies we refer to, and important for uh, today's discussion, evidence integrated. Um, again, AI is the methodology here. Next, please. Um, that's exactly what it says. Um, is AI a different way of evidence integration in toxicology? Next. Um, the starting point of machine learning and AI is um, big data. Um, actually, I like to define AI as making big sense of big data. And the important part is um, AI really shines not just if the volume is big, but it needs variety. It needs the multimodal type of data. It needs the velocity with which this information is accumulating. And next, um, we actually do have a lot of sources which feed in our field. Um, we see that more and more legacy data of the, of the past are curated in databases. Uh, we see the scientific literature accumulating. Um, PubMed alone um, gets about 1 million entries per year. 80% uh, of them have, show some chemical effects, um, not as drugs and uh, toxicants, but often as inhibitors or effectors in our systems. The internet is full of data, also in the safety sciences. We found, for example, 900,000 safety data sheets. Um, sensor technologies, robotized testing, the omics technologies, and high content imaging um, are new sources of data-rich technologies. Next. Um, interestingly, um, at the moment, uh, it is an enormous part of the work of any data scientist to um, get access to later data and clean them. Um, the survey said about 45% of the time of a data scientist is used for this purpose. Next. Um, we, in this case, I have to praise uh, Tom Lichtefeld uh, with Toxtrack, who is working 50% of his time in my team. Um, and has is entertaining two companies in the AI space, uh, Toxtrack and Insilica. He has been programming so-called BioBricks, um, which is a, a one-line command code to import in, uh, entire databases. And he has done 50 of these um, so that essentially all relevant databases can be uploaded within minutes to hour, an hour um, in, in total to give the largest database uh, on safety science data in the world. Next, um, what you can see here is one example, the first five databases he combined um, in Chem Harmony, uh, for example, uh, in, um, they are giving us 200 million cases where we have a chemical, a property, and a result. And this is the treasure trove for training now models uh, on these. It is definitely a uh, first time really a, a big database of um, chemical effects. And we are going to make these um, 50 biobricks soon publicly available that really with a one line command without knowledge of the structure of databases or the programming code being used, uh, anybody can import uh, the relevant information. Next. 
Um, a big part of the progress at the moment is natural language processing. Um, the big advance at the moment is really that also this becomes multimodal. Um, already now, um, scientific literature is essentially read by a computer, almost as good as by a PhD student, but not one paper per week, but um, millions a day and never forgetting anything. And the big challenge is actually multimodality. Um, the reading of tables and figures is the, the challenge we are seeing at the moment. Next. But if you see the number of scientific articles logarithmically increasing at the moment, um, this is really of key importance. Interestingly, next, um, if you ask for what is the information coming from which made, made uh, ChatGPT and others at the moment intelligent, 9% um, of all data uh, which went into training this are in the science and health area. And you can see here the top sites, um, very clearly the open access journals of, uh, uh, of PLOS and Frontiers are representing a very important source. Yeah? So this is really a reason why we can expect these models also to help us with some of the, um, um, of, of the tasks at hand. Next. Um, here you see um, in a logarithmic scale, the increase in um, these large language models um, and already uh, the contribution of bidirectional encoders, which uh, Google made in to, uh, around 2018, uh, the BERT system led to next uh, specifically pre-trained um, uh, systems of CAMBERT and CYBERT. Next, please. Um, so these are systems where um, the context of uh, art, scientific articles is considered so that the system understand it is reading now a scientific article. Um, and then um, next, in February of this year, uh, Microsoft released BioGPT. Um, BioGPT is now specifically trained for scientific literature. And next, here you see the effectiveness of this. BioGPT is performing better than a human annotator in annotating scientific articles so to retrieve the respective information. And this shows you um, the more enormous progress in this field of integrating information. Next. Um, our own interest um, is very much into systematic reviews. And one of the products uh, ToxTrack has developed is called SysRef. Um, it is a publicly for free available um, program software, which has given rise to uh, more than 10,000 systematic review projects, um, which are um, registered here already, and is using for system semi semi automated uh, systematic reviews uh, machine learning. So it trains on uh, the inclusion criteria and then the actual choice of abstracts. And after 100 to 200 abstracts by a human assessor, has learned as good as a second human uh, to find which papers should be included and can then assess uh, hundreds of these, uh, thousands of these. Next, please. So what this is next, uh, what uh, SysRef is doing is auto extracting and annotating. Um, we, have, we are boostering this at the moment um, to recognize natural entities such as genes, enzymes, um, and others, and uh, the causal relationships between them. And uh, our goal is really to um, fine tune this uh, to, in order to import tox relevant information uh, out of the literature. Next. Um, in the context of the, oops, this is really forward. Please go for click. And again, again, it's a mistake. Okay. So what we have been um, doing ourselves is now um, developing predictive algorithms. Already in 2018, um, we built a, a large model um, for 10 million structures. For 900,000, we had uh, some type of information, 74 properties we were looking at. And we showed that we were able for 190,000 chemicals um, where we had classifications done based on OECD animal tests, that we were 87% correct in predicting these, um, while the reproducibility of the animal tests was only 81%. In the meantime, next, we have shown that um, also with respect to human data, uh, this model is superior to its, uh, the best animal test in predicting human skin sensitization, for example. Next, in November of last year, we showed we can run this on thousands of chemicals. In this case, we chose 4,700 foot relevant substances and carried out in less than an hour. 
the equivalent of 38,000 animal studies, which would cost more than $250 million. And we were, again, about 83% correct in a small validation set we analyzed, so at least as good as the animal tests. Next, and at the Society of Toxicology in March, we showed that also the more complex toxicities such as cancer and reproductive toxicity can be predicted with reasonable predictive values, accuracies of 75 and 82%. Next. Um, in the context of the European Ontox project, um, a $20 million project with 18 partners, um, us and ToxTrack as the US partners, at the moment we are um, applying this methodology to liver, kidney and the developing brain. Um, I have the privilege to lead the AI part next, um, which is essentially trying to use SysRef to extract data from the literature. Next, it is using databases through these biobrick tools, which I described. And third, um, next, uh, based on another product from um, one of Tom Lichtefeld's companies, ChemChart, we are crawling the internet for soft data. And this together, next, is giving us the data we then use in a second phase, next, in order to train a variety of models. Um, read post based structure activity relationship is the method I described for chemical structure-based um, predictions we have been developing, but we also feed automatically in physiological maps and AOP networks to understand the causal relationships. And this next is being used uh, from uh, understanding the perturbation of physiology and the chemical structure and properties, uh, a probability of hazard. So to predict ultimately how probably how probable is it that a certain chemical of interest has a certain property next um, this is leading us to a key problem from my point of view in environmental health which is that we like to work in a black and white environment of a substance being toxic non-toxic carcinogenic non-toxic uh, carcinogenic while the reality is a lot of grades of shade uh, shades of gray with a lot of uncertainties um, next and um, we have made an AI-based uh, probabilistic risk assessment the core of evidence integration in our project. And we're going to have next month the second workshop um, on a probabilistic risk assessment. Uh, here's a white paper from last year um, where we are looking into perturbation of biology to train uh, for probability of hazard. Next. Um, I think this is... Um, essentially coming to an end here. Um, we, have a, we are at the moment witnessing that our traditional system of um, yeah, hypothesis-driven research, uh, experimental um, tests of one uh, aspect after the other is being enhanced by two things. Next, um, one is machine learning and AI. Uh, through big data, we are um, synthesizing evidence and combining uh, the various pieces of information. And the other side, um, evidence-based methodologies. Um, you can say this is the best what humans can do. Systematic reviews, quality scoring, and similar. I have the privilege to have the first chair for evidence-based toxicology, and we are hosting the, um, the uh, evidence-based toxicology collaboration. And we are trying at the moment to bring these two together so that we uh, can use for reinforcement learning the um, evidence-based methodologies and help to mine the big data even more effectively. Next, with this, um, I would like to close uh, with John Maynard Keynes, an economist who very rightly said, the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones. I hope I've shown you some of the new ideas brewing at the moment with Tox Ecology, written with an AI, um, with how I like to call it at the moment, um, a science in transition. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Horton. Uh, this is a wonderful talk. Um, we don't have our third speaker today, so we are going to go directly into a discussion and our panel. That was short. Yeah, <laughs> I can ask a just a high level question, and I think it's been been coming up, not just in the context of this talk, but I do I, I really appreciate all the 
uh, the the really great overview of all the increasing increasingly available resources uh, with respect to to AI and increasing ways that we can use it for I don't know lots of things. <laughs> um, and so, what the, the question it's raising for me is around public trust um, in these tools and just recognizing that because they're so new, because people might be aware of, of sources of biases that already exist in various systems and technologies. Um, you know, how are, how are we thinking about, or how might you be thinking about in your work, how we can provide sufficient information for the public to understand the way these tools work um, in a way that also reassures them that uh, it can be trusted. I don't know. <laughs> no, you, have, you nailed this. Uh, this is really the, the problem. Um, but what I'm not arguing for is to uh, give these tools any autonomy and see them as the ultimate decision taker is at the moment um, a way of integrating data um, which a human brain cannot handle anymore and giving on a silver platter some suggestions how to interpret these. But we need the human in the loop, not only by training these models, but also by evaluating them. Um, we have to ask, does it make sense um, what the system is suggesting? But I think it is at the moment um, a prime tool to enhance our decision taking, um, to look what smells like problem, what can be put on a back burner, perhaps, and increasingly learn what the, the quality of these predictions is. And we are at the very beginning. Um, these systems are around for four or five years now, and they get better uh, in a, with a velocity, which is unheard of. Um, we must use it. It would be stupid not to take advantage of this. So I'll go with the computer science way of saying that the, I think trust is potentially overrated, right? So, you know, there's all this discussion about whether we care about privacy and security. But if you look at what everybody posts, right, like in a public forum, uh, I do wonder whether, you know, a lot of it is we're just hiding behind the need to convince the public that this makes sense. Uh, I think what we can think about, you know, some perspective is to think about, well, how can we utilize it to make, to help better decision-making? In the end, it should still come back to the human, right? And and that's that's the best we can do for now. Uh, I, I think, you know, in the first set of sessions, there was this discussion, right? If we tr keep training these AI on, on human decision-making, uh, maybe that's going to exacerbate biases, right? But I think a lot of it is, well, what if we integrate more data? Would that help mitigate some of that? And I think those are questions that we don't know the answer to. Uh, and part of it is com convincing the public that maybe that is the perspective that we should be taking. I mean, yeah. I mean, when humans can find um, the bias, the machine can also find the bias. We only have to train the machine to learn that bias is a problem. And um, and and this is why I'm, I I think that that the machines have to learn from our evidence based approaches, which are the most systematic way of objectively and transparently analyzing. Uh, information. And there's also a big move to explainable AI um, so that the AI explains why it comes to a certain conclusion. And this makes is a game changer if you want to take decisions on the basis of AI predictions. Um, Megan Weilachoff, for those who are online and can't see in the room. Um, <laughs> I am almost afraid to say this because I feel like it's uh, anathema to Americans, but, you know, I feel like the games that I play on my phone, I'm giving away more information than I give away through my medical records um, and trying to get one doctor to share my medical records with another is ridiculous. So I, are there folks talking about this <laughs> in the U.S.? I mean, it just seems like we should be doing a better job job to advance the science. I think somebody had a slide on that in the in the or in an earlier session. Um, but maybe that's a recommendation that can come out of this workshop is rethinking what we as Americans share about our health data and how private it really needs to be. I feel like people are gonna really push back on me. So go ahead, David. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll push back a little bit and then I'll also give you words for encouragement. Um, you know, so I, I think you have to look at the reasons why we have the protections that we have in place, because there is a history of abusing the power that we had. 
Um, so, you know, I, I think we need to be very careful in in stepping back from some things that we put in place to protect the most vulnerable. Um, you know, that said, the All of Us program has an extraordinarily aggressive data sharing uh, policy. You know, so all of the data that they are collecting on everybody that they are collecting is made available, you know, in a, a, a pretty transparent way, you know, we are going through an effort now, and I don't know if Allison's going to talk about this, um, to to add location information to there. And so there's going to have to be, you know, as we were having the conversation earlier today, there's going to have to be some level of protection. You know, that's not going to be as transparent as, as you know, the some of the EHR data is going to be. Um, but, you know, I think there there is reason for optimism that that we can work in other ways within the existing systems that we have. So we don't have to walk back on the requirement for IRBs uh, to, to, to look at things that we're doing. So I would also say, you know, there's been a lot of research done at the federated learning and privacy preserving world as well. Uh, and I think what's holding it back a lot is that databases aren't standardized, right? Even if you look with an EPIC, uh, any two healthcare institutions have different ways of doing it. Um, and then that's really unfortunate because you can't even share within the EPIC ecosystem. Uh, and I think part of this is pushing, you know, those problems to the forefront. A lot of it we've been sort of hiding it behind. Maybe we should develop fire standards or maybe we should think about Odyssey or OMOP or, or different standards. Uh, I think there probably needs to be some push towards just saying this is the one standard we're going to go with and this will enable more of the sharing across institutions. Um, and in that perspective, then the sharing will be more along what we're doing with our games or posting on social media, right, about ourselves. The good Sounds thing like is a good alone. Yeah. And the good thing is we're not alone. The same problems hold for every aspect of life. And um, these technologies uh, pose new challenges, but they also give some answers. Yeah, We heard some of them already. Um, you can train things, systems behind fi uh, firewalls uh, and never hand the data out and that's the federated approach. You have blockchain to exchange information in a secure way. You can produce synthetic data sets, which still contain information, but nothing is um, identifiable anymore. Um, there is uh, really a number of tools coming up because we have to solve this. But as a society, we should be interested in um, encouraging data sharing by telling the people what we do and what we will do and why we want the data. And then there's an astonishing willingness to share um, if they have trusted players. Um, and this is something which is really important. If you tell them what they get in return for making data available, um, people are astonishingly willing um, to share. I would like to ask Dr. Ho a question, if you guys don't mind, as important as the privacy conversation is. So going back to the social determinants of health point that you were making, and I love all the sort of new and novel data streams that you are using and exploring. I guess my question is, you know, when we talk about things like the area deprivation index or the SDI, these are these constructs about latent processes that we can't really measure or ground truth in a specific way, but we think they're capturing a larger context around deprivation issues, right? Um, and I completely agree with you that there's a lot of ways they're sort of misused or not used to their full potential. But based on your talk, are you saying, like, you know, these novel data streams, are they doing a better job at capturing factors related to social determinants of health? Or are they just seeing something very different that's perhaps closer to the human experience in a way about, you know, things that we think of as exposure measurement error classically, right? Like, I think the novelty is they can really get to what people are experiencing on the ground but also layered onto that, do you sort of worry about like biases and who's contributing the data or who geotags their tweets versus not, or like open street map? I know that's a huge topic, but I guess I just want more of your thoughts on what are they really capturing? Thanks. So we've had this conversation a lot between my collaborators and myself. Um, and part of it is, you know, gaining acceptance in, in a field. So I, you know, I feel, Feel I'm an outsider, right? And uh, people really don't like me. <laughs> Maybe because I, you know, computer scientists uh, stomping over uh, other places. Um, but I, I think what we're capturing, right? So a lot of the ADI and SDI are very census-based measures, and 
they're captured every 10 years or something, and you really don't see changes in them fast enough, right? And if you look at, you know, how populations have been shifting towards cities, there's there's a lot of that at play. Um, I, I do agree a lot of these streams will have biases, right? But the hope is that in the integration of more of them, right, uh, in, in looking at how you distill information and, and get it. So let's take the pharmacy one, for instance, right? So what we found actually is when we asked the Georgia Board of a pharmacy for the list, they sent us everything, including the small mom and pop shops that typically patients won't go to, right? Most of us will use CVS, Walgreens, and those things. Uh, and so it's it's unlikely that someone will go to those places because that's just not what they're used to, right? Um, and so from that perspective, you know, in some ways you're capturing more of what is likely to be used, right? Uh, and it is a different construct than what ADI and SDI were set to do, right? Um, and we've been having this discussion as to how you can showcase that it works because everybody, you know, I mean, I, I think Thomas said it best, right? Like it's really hard to get rid of the old ideas, right? Uh, and replace it with new ones. Everybody thinks deprivation is probably the best indicator of neighborhood measures, or, or at least, you know, it's, it's very commonly used and very widely accepted. And to propel new measures is actually hard unless you, sort of like validate against existing ones, if that makes sense. And so I think what we're seeing is there's mismatch of information across the two sources. It's not really sure which one you truly trust, right? And uh, really there needs to be more analysis to determine you know, what makes sense. So all the different categories that we presented, they'll all have different impacts, right? Um, healthcare facilities might look quite different than what we might see in, in pharmacies. And so I think, We've started to tease and uh, unravel it. I, I don't know that I know the answer yet, uh, unfortunately. But I, I'm, I'm, you know, all this work that I presented is is all under review at the moment, and so it's it's all very new, uh, even for my group. Yeah. If may I quickly comment on this, um, I, I think that these type of indexes are twenty uh, century type of science. It is the best humans can do to handle complex data, but uh, we are also losing a lot of information by squeezing everything into an index. And the opportunity of machine learning is to leave them as they are and find the way through all of this. And in the end, uh, identify what are that what were the what were the parameters which really informed best um, for um, meeting our our result, our needs, yeah. Um, I think the, we should not sort too much. Uh, humans can only handle seven variables. <laughs> the, uh, these systems can handle billions, yeah? Oh, there's hands up. Daryl and Chris. Thank you very much, Thomas. I agree with you um, to a certain extent, but I think that what um, Karen um, was saying, um, it, you know, the trust. So as a public health practitioner, I tend to be contrite with respect to the history and that trust thing. Just look at the National Public Health Study of syphilis, right? So that's, you know, that trust thing is real. But um, Joyce, in terms of I think the deprivation index, right? Well, for an example, with COVID, um, the CDC is now considering and has put into motion taking away SVI and replacing it with HOI, okay? So, you know, next time I see you, I would like the answer to um, run that versus um, HOI, right? EJ and EBD, environmental burden, plus yours, and let's see what happens, okay? Terms of the malls, okay, yeah, but yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question. Yeah. I'll make my graduate student do that. <laughs> <laughs> so we also have a question from Kristen. Kristen, Hi. yep. So I am not there to be with you all today. It's um, and you don't really want to see me on camera, so um, I apologize. But um, going back to this question of these deprivation indices versus sort of the newer version it, opportunity for using natural learning processes and AI to really think about it. I, I think we also as scientists really need to really put everything in context and really think about the questions we're trying to ask with these data that we have and so and the mechanisms by which these processes work, right? So if you're wondering what the long-term impacts of deprivation over a life course on an individual 
um, in accelerating disparities in disease, AD, ADI might be appropriate, right? Because we can't use, but if we're trying to predict hospitalizations and or better treatments of care and or exacerbations of disease in a more acute framework, then these other models in AI really do make a, a big difference. So I think it's like anything we've always done in epidemiology, but we really have to think about the context that we're and the questions that we're trying to answer and the mechanisms to really tease out the, the value, validity, and, and capability and value of these different metrics in these different analyses we're trying to accomplish. And I think that's going to become really critical as we start to think about all of these different opportunities for data linkage that we have available. Yeah, I, mean, I think all these the basic question is always, is, can the answer be in the data? AI will always find an answer, um, but the common sense should tell you, uh, can it be inside? If you train uh, um, a prediction of stock markets on weather data, um, you will get a result, but not something I would invest on. Yeah, and this is um, holds for every everything you're um, you're looking. Yeah, and I guess it goes back to that classic, you know, back in the day, just did the number of flamingos predict bursts in Florida? I mean, I think that was a, a critical question 25 years ago, and AI could be, you know, so how do we avoid those, you know, those false discoveries? Given that we know that. AI will fi always find something. So what is it as humans we need to be training our students, thinking about um, things to avoid as we start to make use of this technology in these innovative ways? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a... Oh, sorry. Sorry, please. Sorry, you go for it, go for it, please. <laughs> oh. Oh, All right. Uh, so, I I mean, I think education is a is a crucial thing, and I think one of the things that we have sort of masked under the hood is critical thinking. Um, and I, I see this as a, a faculty member these days, right? Especially thinking about the impact of COVID. Uh, you know, I even see it in my own kids, right? They, they don't have much attention to, to focus on some particular thing. And I think part of this is figuring out, well, what, what can we engage them in? And how can we make them, you know, I, I think the biggest problem is we teach them black and white. Right. But the, the bigger thing is nothing in life is black and white. And so how can we think about ethics and legality and can we teach that at a younger age? And I think a, a lot of this can help address of, you know, when when should we think of false discovery as false discovery? When might it be something correlated under the hood? Um, and I think that might be the bigger direction to push as well. So. Amazing series of presentation, really. And uh, one thing that I'm, I've been trying to do when uh, everyone was present is to go online and see whether I could find the method you had. For instance, BioGPT uh, gave me really a lot of excitement. I really thought perhaps one day I will have a helmet, uh, not only typing in the question, but just someone can read my mind and just write for me. Uh, okay. But really... I'm, I'm joking about this, but the part of the question is, uh, uh, what what of what has been presented today is ready for prime time and available to everyone against uh, what uh, is still being developed? And it's a general question about to the speakers, but also I'm thinking perhaps this could be one of the outputs of the workshop where we could uh, create brackets of different products that scientists or practitioners can already use and they're available online and hopefully for free some of them, perhaps others under a, behind a paywall versus uh, projects that uh, we might be on the lookout for and perhaps in one year, 10 years, they might be available to us. So I want to see this, uh, what type of reaction you would have to this idea. I mean, we are at the moment very impressed by the large language models and generative AI but this is only one of the many, many flavors AI comes in. Yeah? Um, and, and these systems are, uh, because of the nature, how they are trained and of what how we are prompting them to work, they are very much hallucinating. But already now, they're extremely good. Yeah, um, I was asked to write a comment on an article by a colleague. And for the fun of it, I put it into GPT-4, said, summarize it, uh, praise it, criticize it. Uh, and put it as a supplement document to my own comments. It was pretty good. I was very impressed. I could have just submitted and everybody would have been happy. Yeah? 
And um, these systems get better and better. Yeah, They were not made for scientific reference texts. Um, they were made to, to make things up, to fill gaps like we do when we are, a chat, when we are chatting. They're chatbots. Yeah? Um, They're trying to, to just get through with whatever things are close to, to reality. But if as soon as we start really putting in uh, more science as input data, more, sci more scientific processes as the way um, we reinforce, um, they will do scientific jobs. Yeah. I, I just read an analysis by a venture capital company, and they say that now already um, a draft of a scientific paper is um, reasonably good. But in five years, they expect it to be of the quality of uh, of the most skilled scientific writers and writing scientific papers. Um, we might be the last generation who learned to write papers on our own. Um, the next ones uh, will just know how to correct them and and and, and polish them. Andrea, do you have a question? Um, I saw the race. Oh, okay. Sorry. So I I think you know it depends on what you're thinking of as as available, right? So I, I think Marzia sort of alluded to this, that a lot of this stuff is not reproducible. And I don't know that you want to, like even thinking about ChatGPT, right? You prompt it with the same question and it regenerates answers for you. Uh, and that really harms reproducibility because you, you know, any two patients, do we really want different answers depending on slight language tweaks? Um, I, I think, you know, Part of it is stepping back and figuring out, well, what do we want the tool to be able to do? Is it to write papers in, in a deterministic or, or less you know, generative where, where there can be a lot of craziness? Uh, do we need to put it behind a paywall? Um, who's going to use it? And, and I think if we think about along those dimensions, there will be a, a bunch of tools that are available. But I, I think in the end, reproducibility is the biggest question mark in my mind uh, towards achieving and I think there's been this push towards fair principles as well, right? And if 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 I'm going to use that as the ethos, then I'd say a lot of these tools are not there. Uh, but if for you know for discovery, for thinking about it, I, I think most a lot of it will be available. Yeah. Oh, we have Genshin next. Um, very good, nice discussion. I want to um add on to the uh, discussion about uh, rep uh, reproducibility, um because I'm from the geography background. I, um, there is a very good paper on peanuts uh, by Professor Michael Goodchild about uh, how to do reproducibility, uh, how to achieve reproducibility across space, especially for this large language model, because our topic is about environmental health. So it's care about uh, how the model prediction across the space. So usually uh, all the times when the, uh, say the foundation models, the prediction is, but performance varied, even if you're looking from a geographic space, um, say it can achieve a, a, a very good in US, but not in Africa or other places. So I wonder, like, uh, is there any suggestions on, uh, but it, this model is very hard to, to, mo to modify or even to, uh, so is there any suggestions or uh, what will be uh, the, solution or uh, suggestion for us. So I, mean, I think, oh, sorry, go for Thomas. I mean, the, the, the first thing is, uh, I think actually the opposite is the case. Um, this is one of the most democratizing uh, technologies we have ever seen. Um, if you see that uh, GPT-3 uh, found 400 million users in two months, yeah, there's never been access to technology so fast um, anywhere. And the prices are, um, extremely affordable um, for what it delivers. Actually, um, I, I I don't think that I don't want to advertise for them, but uh, I'm just saying it is delivering already astonishing um, uh, good products. And if you now unleash all of these clones, all of these uh, open um, source uh, uh, activities, uh, we will we will be seeing tremendous improvements of these of these models. But we have certainly also to manage expectations. What, what can we expect from such a system? 
Um, we have to set in place things to, to control that you cannot assume another identity, that you should be transparent where you use these tools uh, because it is plagiarism if you if you just uh, squeeze out something from the similars in the world who have done something uh, like you. Uh, and so these, these are challenges for society, but the, the, the access is, uh, I think, the, the least, uh, is, is the one I see most positive of all, yeah. So I think there has been a big movement towards making all of the data it trains on open. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion, especially in thinking about GPT models and chat GPT, right? A lot of it is reinforcement learning base. There's, there's human in the loop. Uh, and those prompts are not available actually for anybody to replicate. And so I think until we get to the point where uh, we can get all the data that went in and all the human annotations that came along with it, it, it will be very hard. But that's exactly where, you know, they're making the money, right? Is they're, no, they're not gonna release this data. Uh, and so I think part of it is, you know, maybe thinking about open sourcing some of this so that the community creates it, helps curate it. Uh, we think about sharing prompts and how we're using it and exact samples that we're using for it. And, and clearly, you know, if we're thinking about healthcare or health diagnosis, there will be HIPAA issues, but thinking about maybe synthetic data to help train it. I, I think those are all options that are feasible for these large language models, yeah. I just want to come back to Andrea's point. Um, one of the things that I would love to see come out of this workshop are some tools, like a really short just toolkit for people who are interested in integrating these areas. So, And I was just going to inquire about ethical guardrails. Um, Thomas, could you say something about that? We'd be remiss if we didn't discuss that a bit with regard to the um, language models. Overall, actually. Mm. I mean, the, the first thing is the, uh, I think that ethics should be the guidance for regulation. Um, you cannot regulate on the basis of technological developments uh, if you see that uh, this is doubling in capacity every three months. Yeah, um, No legislative process is fast enough. So we need to understand what are the principles and they're not very different to the principles which are behind current regulations and laws. Yeah. Um, you cannot cheat. <laughs> you, you you need to 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 be clear who is talking. Yeah, and you cannot uh, take what other people produced and make uh, and and sell it as, as your own. Um, I think these are important things. Yeah, and then there are specific things where we have to find ways of um, of validating these tools. Uh, we need people we can trust who give it a check and tell us how well does it work. Um, I mean, I've been heading a validation body for cell culture models for the European Commission. Um, it is a big task, but I think the um, it is exactly what we need. If we want regulatory decisions to be taken on the basis of AI, then somebody has to write it and, and really um, explore it uh, extensively to understand what is the risk in, 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 in using such a tool. I have a different type of question for the panel, uh, which is honestly inspired by the comment, one of the comments that Thomas made that uh, one of the tools you presented can be better or similar now to a PhD student. And uh, by the way, my PhD students are better than me, so I'm really worried that I'm going to be phased out uh, soon. But uh, but I mean, the, the, the thing that I really wanted to ask is that there are two issues I would like to bring up. One is, um, I read at some point a comment by Noam Chomsky about ChatGPT, that uh, the difference between machine learning, artificial intelligence, and human is that artificial intelligence will give you answers that are probable based on the data, but only humans will give you answers that are improbable. I wanted to see whether that is true, given, given your knowledge. I, it seemed plausible to me, but I, I'm not an expert. So whether I mean, and I have to say, probably it's very possible that we overestimate creativity we have in our jobs. I mean, it's very possible most of us, uh, are, and certainly this is true for me, come up with probable hypotheses and solutions rather than improbable. The other question, I guess, uh, um, is, is more related to, to another issue, which is uh, the issue of, uh, uh, especially inspired by the personal experience that I have with ChatGPT about hallucination, that ChatGPT seems to lie flat out sometimes. I tried, to, I asked to write a biography of Andrea Baccarelli 
I look much better than I really am. There, I have so many degrees that uh, some prestigious schools that I never even thought about having. And uh, and I have to say, I mean, uh, when I work with my team, uh, I know the level of trust I can put on people. I started to learn to learn that, and I know how how to gauge. I mean, some someone can be great at epidemiology, but I cannot trust them in uh, in toxicology or vice versa. Or sometimes some, 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 some one is can be 99.9% honest and transparent. Other people, less so. I mean, I work with any type of people. So I'm wondering how, whether there's a way to gauge the confidence we have in these systems. I mean, and how to do that. Of course, every system should be perfect. But, uh, but uh, I, I, as of myself, I also understand that I now started to learn what I can trust in ChatGPT and what I don't. I mean, clearly I cannot get get ChatGPT to write uh, an article about myself. And not without checking it. Uh, I mean, I did I did the same. I tried because I said, uh, who is Thomas Hartung? And then um, I, I was also assigned an invention, which I have never done. Uh, but I can check it. Yeah, I can I can check the plausibility. Most of what, what was written was pretty good um, short summary of um, which would have been for me difficult to do so condensed. Yeah. And I we also have to see uh, we have to train these models for their purposes. Um, if you want to write a scientific text and say you restrict yourself to actual sources which you find on the internet, that's a completely different beast than a chatbot, yeah, which is, is trying to give an answer, and uh, it is trained on 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 all of the um, BS in the internet. So we get we get this back, yeah, and uh, but also humans are chatting this way. I mean. I would be happy if they would give me the most probable answer they know. Uh, very often they give me the most provocative answer of the one which they just come up with in, in, in this moment. Yeah. Um, I, I think that we are really, um, we need to define what is not chat GPT doing for science. No, what will be science GPT doing for us if we now give engineering criteria what we need to make it really useful for our purposes. It kind of reminds me of uh, Isaac Asimov's foundation series. Uh, did you guys remember that? It, basically, everything is predicted based on statistics, but they can't predict the one like rogue actor. Um, yeah. yeah. He was a biochemist, if I recall correctly. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, we're almost time. Uh, I want to thank our panelists again for the wonderful presentation and the discussion. I think one thing that we can all come back, go back home and think about is oh, with all these AI tools that we talk about today, how would we as experts in certain area work with all these tools and how do we trust them? How do we have, as other, help other people to trust them as well? It's going to be there. So we need to be ready. So thank you. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> uh, we are going to have a 10 minutes break and we will come back at 3.20.
Hey everyone, um, welcome back from the break. We will get started uh, with this rest of the session today with uh, a brief remarks by Rick Wojcik and then followed by Eric Topol's keynote and finally a fireside chat uh, with the two of them. So first uh, I'll introduce uh, Rick Wojcik who uh, became the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences one of the National Institutes of Health and of the National Toxicology Program on June 7th, 2020. In this role, he oversees federal funding for biomedical research to discover how the environment influences human health and disease. Um, he and his staff receive input from several advisory boards and councils to accomplish this significant task. Uh, prior to becoming director, and since 2011, uh, Dr. Wojcik served as Deputy Director of NIEHS. In this role, he assisted the former director, Linda Birbaum, in the formulation and Im implementation of plans and policies necessary to carry out the NIHS uh, missions in the administrative management of the Institute. So please welcome Dr. Rick Wojcik. Terrific, just doing a, a sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Lucila, great to see you, by the way. <laughs> so, and it's great to be here this afternoon. And so thanks for this opportunity to provide just a few kind of remarks. Uh, I suspect just looking at the program, I'm sorry that I haven't been able to join for the rest of the day, but I just want to reinforce, uh, I think, some of the things you probably already heard. So I'll just start off by saying that I think we're working in some very exciting times. And actually, just to be honest, I've, we're working now at a time and we're doing things that I've been waiting for for my entire scientific career. So we can now imagine employing fundamentally a transformative approach to understanding health and human disease. Um, and this involves integration of multiple different types of data. It could be involving you know, genomics experiments where we get a bond, go beyond one gene at a time to looking at whole genomes and whole transcriptomes. Uh, we can incorporate in data from environmental sciences. And we can also incorporate, and very importantly, data from research that evaluates the social determinants of health. And so now we're taking this more holistic approach. Uh, so it's not just about transcriptome. We're not just about genome. We're not just about one environmental exposure. But we're now taking this holistic approach that recognizes the interconnectedness of all these different factors and how they influence human health and, and well being. So, a key driver of this approach, of course, is what we've been, you've been all been talking about. Um, it's, the, it's, it's having available and uh, our ability to generate. Eight, uh, omics data, um, and this is genomics data, epigenomics data, proteomics data, transcriptomics, and, uh, and more recently, uh, this whole notion of exposomics data, which as uh, Chris Wilde defined back in 2005, it's the totality of exposures over the life course. And I'll say, you know, recent developments in AI have the potential to provide us with the tools to integrate across these various omics data sets and other types of data that we're collecting. And we can do this now in a way that will help us to understand human biology and to understand the etiology of human disease. So the expectation is that by leveraging AI's analytical capabilities, uh, biomedical as well as you know, environmental scientists can join forces and they can begin to elucidate those relationships between environmental exposures and human health with a degree of resolution that I predict that we haven't seen up to this point. Now, I, uh, hopefully you you've been participating in the meeting today. So, I mean, the purpose of this workshop is really to gather experts from diverse disciplines and from various sectors across the biomedical enterprise for the purpose of delving into some of the latest research findings and to explore opportunities for integrating environmental and biomedical data. So we hope that by leveraging new and cutting edge developments in multimodal AI, we can begin to unravel the complexities of an integrative health model. And I'm a big believer of the types of collaborative platforms that will foster discussions on innovative approaches, methodologies, as well as technologies that can enhance our understanding of the interplay between environmental exposures and human health. So at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, NIHS, uh, so we recognize the significance of AI and data science in driving innovation and advancing our mission. 
So NIEHS has already initiated several AI and data science initiatives, and we are actively involved in developing and supporting policies for data integration, data management, ensuring and ensuring that uh, NIEHS data adhere to the FAIR principles, making them findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And also the some of the new efforts around developing standardized vocabularies and ontologies on how we handle environmental data. The convergence of AI and big data, including that from environmental health scientists, I think represents a powerful opportunity to drive scientific knowledge and improve the human health outcomes. So NIEHS will continue to support and to develop resources that promote the responsible and equitable generation, integration, and utilization of environmental health data. We are committed to collaborating with other NIH institutes and centers to integrate our data resources across the, broad, the broader biomedical enterprise. And I know you've been talking about this today. And we feel that by leveraging the synergy of AI, big data, and environmental health research data, we can expect that we can make significant strides in unraveling those complexities of human health and to ultimately pave the way for innovative approaches to promote healthier lives for all. So that's uh, that's it from me. I will turn the virtual podium back over to, uh, I don't know, is it Lucila? Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Rick. Uh, and everyone will hear from uh, Dr. Wojcik again at, at 3.45 Eastern when we will start the fireside chat. Mm -hmm. And before that, we have a, a short uh, keynote address and uh, I will introduce someone who needs no introduction. Dr. Eric Topol, who is Professor of Molecular Medicine and Executive Vice President of Scripps Research. He's the founder and director of Scripps Research Translational Institute. He has published over 1,300 peer-reviewed articles with more than 300,000 citations. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and one of the top uh, 10 most cited researchers in medicine. Uh, his uh, scientific focus has been on the use of genomic and digital data along with AI to individualize medicine. He's also a practicing cardiologist. In 2016, uh, Eric Topol was awarded a significant grant from the NIH to lead a part of the precision medicine, the, uh, now called the All of Us uh, program from NIH. In uh, prior to uh, Coming to Scripps in 2007, he led the Cleveland, Cleveland Clinic to become the number one center for health heart care and uh, was the founder of a new medical school there. He was commissioned by the UK to 2018-2019 to lead planning for the national health services integration of AI and new technologies and has published three bestseller books on the future of medicine. So please welcome Dr. Eric Topol. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to join uh, and I'll, I'll, of course, be mainly getting into the AI in the medical, medical sphere. So let me share my uh, slides so I can get going here. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Um, and hopefully uh, you can see my slides. Is that right? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm going to be talking about multimodal AI, which is really a very recent and exciting opportunity we're just starting to get into, of course. And um, the first thing that we get to when we start to see AI um, impact is reducing the diagnostic errors. There are over 12 million serious errors a year in the U.S., and there's a classic um, NAM report about each person, each American will experience at least one of these diagnostic errors in their lifetime. And when the, when the diagnosis is thought of in the first five minutes, the accuracy is very high, but after that, it precipitously drops. And we have a big problem with overconfidence of physicians who, uh, when a patient dies, the autopsy is, um, demonstrates that the, the wrong diagnosis is uh, the case 40% of the time. So the term precision medicine is a real problem because in, in effect, if you keep making the same mistakes over and over again, it's very precise, but inaccurate. And we need accuracy in medicine. And so what's happened here is that we move from the deep neural network like 
uh, convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks uh, architecture to a whole new uh, architecture called transformers, which allows for this multi-attention inputs. Um, and this is where we get to how we get to multimodal AI. So just with deep learning, we've had an enormous impact before unimodal focused on medical images. And what the term I like to use of machine eyes, obviously machines don't have eyes, but their ability to interpret medical scans is um, is a remarkable and far beyond uh, human capability. So by training from millions of chest x-rays, the uh, radiologists, experienced radiologists will miss in this chest x-ray uh, the presence of a nodule, which turned out to be cancer. And uh, this is across all types of medical scans. This is mammography, the largest study that was conducted by NYU. Uh, but it's much bigger than that. It's seeing things with machine eyes trained as inputs with large numbers of annotated um, uh, scans with ground truths that you then can get to look at through uh, the eye, for example, the retina, uh, ability to track kidney disease, blood pressure, glucose, diabetes control. Um, a window into the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease, predicting heart attacks and stroke, gallbladder and liver disease, high lipids in the blood, heart calcium score. It's remarkable. These are things that we can't see as humans. And then for the electrocardiogram, as a cardiologist, I could never tell you the age and sex or the hemoglobin or the ejection fraction, make difficult diagnoses, be able to tell from the electrocardiogram, the presence of valve disease and its severity, whether the person is likely to develop arrhythmia such as atrial fibrillation or develop a stroke, um, diabetes and prediabetes, the filling pressure of the left ventricle, kidney disease, hyperthyroidism. This is the ability of machine eyes, which is right, quite incredible. And it's already being implemented in the, particularly in Japan and Asian countries that are doing machine vision during uh, colonoscopy and endoscopy, picking up polyps that otherwise would be missed, and also uh, in real time, reporting the likelihood of whether they need a biopsy, whether they are potentially cancerous. So that was the unimodal world of AI until March, when we had the first GPT-4 multimodal large language model. And that has led to uh, something that's not just remarkable with respect to the parameters, the interactions uh, of the neurons, as shown here on this graph, exceeding a trillion, but bringing together all the different modalities, whether it's speech and voice and um, video and images and text, structured and unstructured text. This is not something that happened overnight. This has been building up for decades and getting to this extraordinary levels of computing power, petaflops. And when we look at the parameters trained, uh, we see GPT-4, as mentioned, was a trillion, and the tokens were trained have uh, gone up considerably. Um, and this is the meta llama uh, model, which has got over well over 1.4 trillion. So basically, to simplify this, these are the building blocks. Uh, they should be connected, but I haven't done that yet. Uh, but the, these Lego blocks, first we needed transformer models. They have had uh, requirements for massive amounts of GPUs. But with that, uh, the ability to get into computing uh, power of flops that are, is just um, unforeseen, this required not to be able to annotate the inputs, but to have self-supervised learning. And that got us to this level of multimodal AI. Now, for the, the ability to understand each individual's uniqueness, all these layers of data can now be captured. And that includes the environment, of course, uh, the exposome, but all these other biologic layers beyond just DNA and RNA and microbiome, the physiology through sensors, the anatomy through these scans, and of course, the electronic health record, and the immunome. 
So we had a recent review about this topic of multimodal uh, AI in medicine, and it leads to all sorts of remarkable uh, possibilities. I'll touch on at least one of these, but it's very broad applications once you can bring together all these different uh, fields, domains of data. Just this week, uh, a couple of days ago, uh, there was this publication uh, in Nature Biomedical Engineering, which interestingly showed that with multimodal AI, uh, specifically Irene, uh, it was far better than previous models for being able to make the diagnosis of uh, pulmonary disease by integrating chest X-rays, all the lab tests, electronic health record, unstructured text, uh, also for predicting adverse outcomes of COVID-19. So this is one of the first validations of the remarkable uh, increase in accuracy uh, from multimodal AI, bringing together these varied inputs. Now, the hospital is a dangerous place, as it turns out. This is a study from last year of 11 Massachusetts hospitals, some of the leading hospitals in this country, the uh, adverse event rate of people in the hospital was almost 35 per 100 admissions. And you can see the breakdown about adverse, adverse drug events and um, surgical procedures and infections. Well, that really sets up the hospital at home in the future, which, of course, would rely on multimodal AI. So we've done several reviews on this topic uh, beginning a couple of years ago. Uh, about the update on health and medicine, self-supervised learning, how big a step that has been uh, because we didn't have data sets that were massive that could be annotated in this uh, sphere. Uh, that what The one I just mentioned and the one that we just published in April, which was these foundation models or generative AI, large language models that we're discussing here. In that nature review, we basically predicted what GPT-4 would uh, enable. It wasn't yet put out. That was in March, um, uh, March in the middle of March this year. But the idea of taking everything known in medicine through publications, uh, along with the different inputs of images, electronic health records, uh, sensors, uh, biologic data, all those layers of data that you could take medicine um, to a, a new uh, plateau. Now, importantly, uh, this is summarizing the different phases of a, a, a large language model uh, development. The biggest part is this pre-training. And in GPT-4, that has used approximately 30,000 GPUs. So it, it, only a few places in the, in the world would have access to that many GPUs. After which, the fine-tuning that we're seeing now in medicine for various functions uh, is much less computing requirement. Uh, as are these reward modeling and reinforcement learning phases. Now, just to show you a fine tuning, this was a um, for medical imaging, uh, and it already very trained very quickly uh, in 15 hours, and it could do things that's really remarkable and challenging, like looking at a chest X-ray and saying all the different devices that are present, which it would be hard for even radiologists to be very accurate in this. And this has already superseded the performance of GBT-4. But there's lots of problems here. Uh, it's never uh, so straightforward as you'd like. Uh, so we see we can have great summarization of lots of data on a particular patient. Uh, we can improve and even promote empathy. We can do all sorts of administrative tasks like uh, getting rid of or reducing the need for data clerk function and keyboards. Uh, but there are lots of concerns about hallucinations and data security and uh, bias that are very well founded, no less as I alluded to carbon emissions. And we need, of course, a lot more work to validate uh, their presence and utility and safety in healthcare. So this is a good summary just uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, in Nature Medicine on the chasm, I call it chasm of AI in healthcare. The fact that uh, we have lots of myths and we have these realities that people need to be familiar with. So I'll just stop here, uh, which is that there's this amazing two-edged sword with AI in medicine, as it will be applied in many different directions. Uh, and the one, of course, that I'm most excited about that I'm not going to get into is the gift of time that will be um, hopefully uh, afforded and propelled by 
uh, AI and medicine to bring back the humanity, uh, which has suffered so greatly over several decades. So with that, let me just uh, acknowledge a lot of my colleagues who um, I get the privilege of working with, our funding support, and open it up for our conversation and discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I think we have um, about four minutes before we do start the fire, set, uh, fire chat. So um, why uh, don't I abuse my privilege as facilitator to ask a question to, to Dr. Topo? And then we um, I'm asking if people who are present in the room there can also uh, help um, identify who has questions. And my question is precisely regarding the large amount of um, resources needed to uh, train the initial models. Uh, do you uh, think that will uh, widen disparities in whole nations that will be able to do it and others that will not? Yeah, this is really troubling, uh, Lucilo, because um, only a few tech titans like Microsoft and Google and limited others can do this. So we have dominance, hyper dominance. Uh, so it's not even just countries, it's companies uh, and, and globally. So some people think that there will be uh, a much less requirement to do these do this pre-training in the years ahead, that that will be compressed uh, substantially, but we haven't seen that yet. Uh, so this is setting up uh, a very awkward situation where the role of academics and so many others working in this space um, is on the fine tuning, piggyback work, not the actual development. So that's okay because in effect, um, in, at the moment, these models like GPT-4 and BARD and um, med palm, the, these were not uh, really medically trained at all. And so they do need fine tuning. But uh, ultimately, um, it, we, we can't go on to be fully dependent on just a couple of few companies in the world that can string together 30,000 GPUs. It's, it's preposterous. Uh, we're lucky to get a handful of them in our effort. So um, this, a lot of people are not aware. And not only that, but the energy requirement, the cooling requirement, and I mean, this is not helping our environmental crisis. Uh, so, you know, the people, I had a recent uh, discussion, a podcast that will be posted soon with Al Gore, who, of course, uh, has been so deep in warning about the climate crisis. And I asked him, what about this large language models? What's that going to do? And he thinks, you know, it can help come up with new ideas to solve the crowd, but it's also going to engender more problems. Yeah, I wonder if Rick would comment on that environmental uh, uh, effect as well. Not sure that there's much else I can say on this that uh, I think Eric very accurately pointed out the, the environmental uh, parameter here and that uh, we just have to be conscious of that, uh, that it's, it's there, so. Yeah. Uh, so I think we, we, we can officially start the fireside chat, but I see a, a hand raised from Daryl. So I would. Thank you very so much. You, you can un unmute yourself um, and ask the question, I think. Oh, thank you, Lucinda. Um, Dr. Topol, that was just great. I, you know, I thought that we. Um, uh, us that work on the public health exposome side, the um, ecto exposome had a great um, catch all phrase being from the cradle to the grave. But you just topped us with that pre tune to the womb. Wow. <laughs> so thank you for that. But, but no, but, but what I'm more concerned about um, in thinking about this, should we be concerned, for an example, with Irene? The input, uh, are, are there equally weighted um, inputs, of the five that you showed there, or because this is iterative and machine learning, is that something to be concerned about? Right. Well, thanks, Daryl. Um, it's funny, just you pointed that out. Um, one of my uh, 
uh, colleagues and mentors, uh, uh, Bill Kelly, he once said, I, I didn't have the right title for that uh, paper, that review. He said it should have been from lust to dust. So, um, yeah, a lot of different ways to express that. Um, the inputs are the whole story. Um, and obviously, that's where we see the potential biases emerge. It's not so much the transformer architecture of the deep neural networks. It's our, it's our culture. It's putting in the whole internet and Wikipedia and you know, literature. So inputs are big. Um, I think the biggest thing here is that uh, also a study I didn't mention from last week from NYU, they took 330,000 patients from NYU um, uh, health, health system and just basically uh, use all unstructured text and structured text to come up with uh, predictions uh, of readmission, of morbidity, of uh, insurance denials, um, and, and prognosis of survival. Extraordinary. So what we're learning is this basically machine uh, ability to classify, uh, process massive amounts of data and I think what what we got to this point, if the inputs are um, are good, uh, and that I think we could say, and, and are obviously large enough, uh, we're starting to see things that I don't think we expected to come up with. Uh, this is, of course, the whole uh, debate in the AI community, which is: is this uh, some sparks of AGI, as the preprint of Microsoft put out? Is this um, a level of understanding that we did not expect to ever see, if not this early um, in advance? But of course, there are many still maintaining this is a stochastic parrot. Uh, and it's just a matter of statistics and word prediction. It doesn't look that way to me, but uh, it's somewhere in the middle here. And uh, it's, it's a source of big debate. So I think the inputs is not is, is a big deal, as I mentioned, particularly tagging to the potential of biases. But the bigger concern is what are we seeing here? Is this understanding? It's being called a world model, understanding the world. Uh, I, I, you have to decide yourself about that one. Yeah, maybe let's see. Look, maybe I can chime in here too. Um, so, you know, I. You know, when I when I look at some of the key challenges and opportunities, especially as it relates to say environmental data, you know, exposomics data, you know, it's the you know one of the concerns I have is the just the broad heterogeneity and the diversity of different data. So it's very easy to say exposome is the totality of exposures over the life course, uh, but what are we actually measuring? Um, you know, how do you get to the totality of exposures over the life course? Um, you know, lust, dust, <laughs> whatever. And I, I think that that's, that's a real challenge. Um, and the, the, you know, the different data sets, um, you know, you, you compare say transcriptomics too, you have the, the, the you know, chip-based uh, you know, transcriptomes, then you have RNA-seq and you're just the heterogeneity of the data. Um, you know, whatever you get up with AI is gonna be a function of how good your data sets are you know, coming into this. Uh, the other question too is, is it, is it useful to do you know, you know, transcriptomics um, on a whole kidney, or do we have to ultimately get to the point where we're looking at which genes are being expressed or proteins are being expressed or post-translational modifications in specific cell types within, say, the collecting tubule of the kidney? So I think there's some, some challenges. Um, so I just I just worry a lot now about. Uh, what we're going to get out is going to be a function of uh, the quality of the data that we get in. Uh, the last thing I'm going to throw on the table here is the just the overall, um, I'll, I'll talk about consistency and the sustainability of our data repository system. I mean, it's been very, in my mind, it's been very kind of ad hoc and someone has some data, they develop their own database. And now we're, we're, we're hemorrhaging with databases there's no good standardization, consistency in how the databases are constructed. Um, I mean, in the environmental health sciences, we haven't agreed upon a standardized set of, uh, of vocabularies and ontologies and how we collect the data. 
And then, you know, we're also spending huge amounts of money um, you know, maintaining these data repositories. Um, and you know, what do we do on a global scale to eliminate some of the redundancies that occur? Um, everyone establishes their own database because they know how they can manage this. But I just worry that you know, if there's no thoughtful integration across different uh, databases, and, and that could be in exposomics or it could be in genomics or other things, we're spending a lot of money um, to uh, to support things, and and the other thing too is that I've I've been doing a lot of exploration on sustainability frameworks. I mean, for many people, sustainability is getting your grant renewed. Well, that's not uh, terribly sustainable. <laughs> um, it's it's you know what are the elements of uh, of a database uh, that that make it worthy to continue to be funded. Um, or can we imagine that there's a life cycle of data repositories where you know, they, uh, they have usefulness for some period of time, but then after some period of time, uh, you know, there, you know, is there a framework where we can measure whether they're losing their usefulness so we can, we can take the resources out and then re redeploy them to, uh, you know, to another data repository. But it's, uh, so I just raise a, a number of different uh, issues. I'll put it in the context yeah, of the, the, so I don't know, Eric, what are your thoughts? Yeah, the one that you raise that really resonates with me, uh, and I should have um, emphasized it as well, Rick, is the incompleteness of data. So uh, as you aptly pointed out, the biologic layers, even though you might have a DNA sequence of a person, um, all the other ones are cell-specific whether it's, um, you know, RNA, uh, epigenomics. I mean, so you you can't capture all different types of the body or tissues. Um, and also the same, you know, the we're just scratching the surface in, in the area of the environment. We might get air quality or something like that, but what about all the other things? So it's it's terribly incomplete, and that's why it depends on the task that's of interest. If you're trying to that Daryl asked about Irene, the, the the model that was used for better pulmonary diagnoses, you know, um, that you have to understand the limits of those inputs. But we, we right now, even though the theoretically would have all the layers, each of those layers uh, have um, an incompleteness that's noteworthy. Right. I mean, just the 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 physical and chemical uh, complexity of the exposures that we have are it's complicated enough. But then, you know, as I'm sure as Daryl would accurately point out, uh, psychosocial stress is probably yes. one of the the biggest factors. So, how do we measure psychosocial stress in a way that we plug this into these multimodal AI systems where you can be factoring in, say, epigenetic modifications of key genes? That may be downstream from psychosocial stress or sleep behaviors, uh, or you know, blue and green spaces, and uh, so it's 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 very complicated. But uh, I think these are things that we, as the especially the environmental health sciences community, needs to pay attention to, so we can actually develop better better data sets. Um, be it'd be great to get to the point where we could do the types of things you were pointing out, Eric, with uh, with the you know the imaging uh, capabilities that we have in, in hospitals, having you know AI capabilities to actually read the images and uh, and potentially have you know more accurate diagnoses. So and yeah. eliminate some of those uh, some of those problems that we see you know in hospitals and with physicians. Yeah, one of the biggest challenges in the multimodal uh, space is the. Um high frequency or continuous sampling through uh, sensors. So we can get to stress these days with risk sensors, um, with heart rate, uh, heart rate variability. Uh, we can get sleep data through sensors. I mean, we can get, a, but when you have a, immense data sets of an individual, you know, with that type of continuous sampling, how to process that. No one has yet done that, by the way, okay? Taking very, multiple sensors and then integrated with all the other data. So this is at the current, at the moment, this is one of the analytical challenges. You know, you can take electronic health record and an image, okay. When you start throwing in a bunch of sensors with weeks, months worth of data, trying to understand their stress level and their sleep health and, you know, all sorts of other things, it hasn't been done yet. No, Eric, I, I totally agree. And that, that's where I think, quite frankly, where, you know, the AI and ML 
can come into play because it's, it's these are, you know, any given data set is just uh, very complex. Just take transcriptomics, which is probably the simplest of, of, of the, or genomics. Um, and by the way, I mean, we're, we're also still not factoring into the equation, the somatic mutations that may be arising during the life course that may be influencing uh, in, in very serious ways, the development of cancer or other, other health outcomes. Right. But yeah, so that's where I think it's, it's uh, you know, we have these, these capabilities to go in and let some of these powerful tools integrate across uh, these, these different data sets and, and hopefully give us, you know, greater insights into, uh, into human biology. Great. I, I see a question on the chat, uh, though I don't know if Rima Habri has a microphone. So I'll just repeat it here. Um, so it's a question for Dr. Topol. You mentioned it's not uh, more quantity of data, but rather higher quality and more complete diverse lab labeling of data that is needed. Uh, are we investing in creating systems to generate better and higher quality labels that are unbiased to better serve discovery as much as we are investing in better predictive power of these AI models? What would we need to get there to incentivize this? Yeah, well, I think it's fair to say that um, the labeling uh, is going out the window here in healthcare. Uh, there were only a limited number of well done annotated data sets. So, you know, we saw it like for chest x rays and skin lesions and, you know, retinal photos. And then basically the medical community abandoned this because it's so resource consumptive and you can't get experts to spend their time doing it. And fortunately, around that time when that realization was uh, being made, there was also the whole self supervised learning, letting the data, um, you know, basically if you will, label itself. Um, so that's where we are now. Um, we're, we're not unlikely going back. It would be great to have cross-validation between annotated, carefully annotated by expert and uh, self-supervised or unsupervised data sets, but it doesn't look like it's likely to happen um, because we just don't get that many expert uh, physicians to be willing to put in the time at scale to do this with hundreds of thousands of you know of images or you know whatever inputs uh, you're talking about so um that's where things are headed now uh is is uh it's basically abandoning that idea that Rima has brought up um but on the other hand um we're learning that you can get a lot out of unlabeled data uh like i mentioned that NYU study um the, uh, the the study I mentioned with the Irene uh, model this week uh, for ch or ch pulmonary, these are completely self-supervised um, um, model examples. So we'll be seeing a lot more of that. But uh, that goes back to what Rick has emphasized with the incompleteness, inaccuracy of the data, as well as the bias of the data that goes in, which you can't, uh, especially when you're not even trying to label anything and it just compounds the problem. We could, with large language models, we could make these problems worse. Mm -hmm. Hey, Eric, I'd like to get your your point of view on the the issue that I raised around heterogeneity of data repositories, and yeah, you know, we have this this new efforts that are happening. I think primarily in Europe around the Global Biodata Coalition, where maybe we could be a little bit more proactive in planning. You know, what are the data repositories that the world community needs? Uh, and if they don't exist, how do we create them and how do we fund them with sustainability frameworks? I don't know, what, are, what are your thoughts on this whole concept of data repositories? Well, you know, the one that's had the biggest impact in, uh, in medicine actually has been the UK Biobank, which has been um, just every week there's new insights papers being published so that i think has proven now that these are extraordinarily important with open access to the research community and that's what all of us of course aspires to when it gets um you know fully loaded with the million participants and all the deep data for each but um we don't have as you nicely point out the kind of collaborations and standardization and 
you know, we haven't seen many data repositories that have made contributions at the level of the UK Biobank. Uh, it would be great if we um, could do that. Now, what's interesting, in Israel, they form what's called the Human Phenotype Project. And they've had 14,000 people who have actually, about 5,000 already been back for uh, the second visit, where they do, you know, every layer of data that you could possibly collect, including cognitive testing and retinal photos and, you know, everything in medicine you can imagine. Um, gut microbiome and, and uh, of course, sequencing and, you know, things that uh, immunologic studies. Now, they are trying to, they are going to other countries and the, Japan, uh, countries in the Middle East, uh, to try to come up with, as you're getting at, a standard way of collecting data, uh, of, of organizing the data, making it accessible, all open access. Um, they're getting a little uh, traction on this, but they're one of the first groups I know of, Wiseman Institute, that's tried to do it. Well, we haven't really had the kind of global collaboration that we need. And essentially, we're relying on, you know, just very limited sources, even though there's so much activity in this space. Yeah, no, I think that that's where, I mean, that, you know, being an IC director, I, I, we've been talking a lot about this. What's the role of the NIH to help uh, kind of nucleate some of that centralized governance? And uh, so we're, we're trying to get some things happening along those lines. It just, we have to get away from this model where everyone does it on their own. Um, right. And, you know, it's laudable that UK has done this with UK Biobank. It's laudable that Israel is doing this, the Weissman is doing. Yeah. But we got to get away from everyone you know, realizing something needs to be done. So I'm going to pick up the mantle and then I'm going to run with it. Um, you know, there needs to be uh, more uh, coalition. Are you familiar with the Global uh, Biodata Coalition? I've heard of it, but I don't know any of the details. Yeah. Well, it's something maybe we can all pay a little bit more attention to. I know one of the things, too, we're struggling with at the NIH is that maybe we need a GBD model for the different databases that are funded across the 27 institutes and centers at the NIH. Uh, so that's a challenge as well. Yeah, that would be great to pull that all together. Well, see, so, I know we have limited time. I just also wanted to throw in, and, and Eric kind of uh, you know, touched on this, the issue of, uh, of you know, wearable biosensors and various things, how we collect data. I think that's, that's you know, if, if you look, you know, I think one of the questions is what are the advanced and developments you anticipate in the coming years? I think getting to the point where we have those uh, uh, individual wearable technologies um, and that can dump data in, in some structured way into these data repositories. We could take advantage of this. I think it's going to be really important. Yeah, and that's one of the things that came out of um, UK Biobank because they had tens of thousands of people, over 50,000 with Fitbit. And so that was, you know, exemplary of what you can learn uh, yep. from that sort of thing. And yeah, and you know, the other thing that you're touching on, which is a theme that can't be emphasized enough, is diversity of inputs. And, uh, you know, the UK Biobank is largely European ancestry, almost exclusively. And it's only by combining forces, as you touched on, that we can get to the diverse race, ethnicity, and every other aspect that we want to have as uh, inputs for, for these models. I mean, as a geneticist, uh, the one thing I appreciate, almost anything you look at is going to be a function of genetic background. Exactly. Uh, genetic slash epigenetic background. And uh, yet, you know, you've got, if you got to factor that into the equation. No and question. You, it. It's really laudable that, uh, that the leadership at the All of Us program are really making a, a real effort to make sure that that million person cohort is represents the diversity, at least across the United States. Of course, in the, the global community has a challenge of looking at the the global diversity that exists in the human population. Yeah, uh, with just about half of the people of the 600,000 are underrepresented minorities. This is um, a feat that's never been, yep. uh, you know, uh, even approximated in the past. So it's a really 
standout uh, aspect. The other thing, of course, is returning the data to participants, which is what all of us aspires to do. And that's something we've got to do better as well. That is, you know, you can have all these large language models and do all these publications, but is, when, when are we going to start helping patients, right? And yep. so getting this to be things like virtual health coach uh, in the future uh, are, are exciting opportunities. And, you know, I could foresee where, you know, uh, where you where someone's at risk for asthma and you're giving them all their inputs, like we've seen with the Louisville study on uh, uh, hotspots for asthma and reducing the toll of asthma um, as just one example where by people having that feedback that they're getting continuously for, for themselves. So that's another thing that we haven't done yet. It's nice to publish all these papers, but let's help patients, people. You got it. I totally endorse that. And, and it's really getting, putting, putting our science to work for the benefit of public health. Exactly. Excellent. I, I see that Kristen Malecki has a, a question. Maybe she can unmute. Oh, sure. Sure. I mean, I think <laughs> this is all really helpful. And I think that last answer um, or that last example really starts to get at my question. You know, the, the goal of these workshops is really to think about, are we ready now to integrate environmental data into these large predictive health AI type, um, you know, mechanisms? And if so, where do we start? How do we begin? What, you know, what are the current barriers? And, um, you know, are we at a point where chemical structures could be integrated in here? And then if so, what do we do with that information? And if not, what are the barriers and how do we get healthcare really to start thinking about these environmental factors as critical to sort of patient vulnerability and susceptibility and or, or response? Oh. Rick may be able to answer that better than me. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, the, I guess we, we need an operational kind of definition of how we collect the environmental data. You know, do we have chemical structures, but it, it may not be just one chemical. I mean, if we're really, in, you know, if we, you know, Eric, you, you, you may have heard this, but the environmental health sciences community is absolutely embracing the notion that if we want to understand the effect of the environment on human health, we have to embrace this totality of exposures because it's not just air pollution. Uh, it's, and, and well, it's not just all of the different components of air pollution. Air pollution is a catch all term for PM 2.5, for ozone, for a whole variety of different chemicals. But it's going to be also the, uh, the flame retardants you're probably breathing in coming from, I don't know, you have a leather, a chair, maybe you don't have it in yours, but it's, uh, it's this totality of exposure. We've got to figure this out. And, and how to put this together in some way where we can uh, ultimately, you know, use this to to our our better understanding. And you know, it, the other approach too is a lot of the exposomics work, and we're not talking as much about well, can we measure some of the biomarkers and biological effects of exposures? Uh, so you know, my mother was probably ex exposed to things. Um, she wasn't even aware of, but uh, my epigenome is probably reflecting that. It's influencing how my genes are being expressed. So we, you know, it's a it's it's a it's a complicated issue, but it's uh, it's one that we we need to be focusing our our planning activities around. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, there's a lot of things out there that are very disturbing, like seeing the rates of cancer increasing substantially in younger people. Which brings to mind, what is it about their environmental exposures that's doing that? Because, you know, seeing people in their 20s with colon cancer more and more now, what is going on here? Uh, and uh, there's nothing to indicate that there's uh, genetics in play. So um, I hope we can make some headway here. Uh, and uh, this is one we barely have our arms around in the medical community, uh, because the only things we can tap into are things that are you know, nominal, marginal of uh, very. There's no depth there uh, as you're getting it. I hope those we'll, we'll see a real improvement. Well, the other thing too, I just want to throw on the table here is that you know, in the environmental community, we focus so much on all the bad things in the environment. Uh, well, the fact is that there are actually a lot of good things uh, in the environment. Uh, I don't think we we still have any clue of why exercise is uh, so beneficial. And there, you know, there's plenty of data now emerging that those omega-3 fatty acids, 
from fish, even though they may have methylmercury, there, there are you know, health benefits associated with those omega-3 fatty acids um, and the polyphenols in blueberries and blackberry. This is for real. So they can be positively impacting our health. But you know, figuring out how do we integrate that into an exposomics framework is also part of our challenge. Yeah, the nutritional side of this is 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 ginormous. And uh, just another part, we, we in our studies, we try to get two weeks of everything a person eats, take pictures of it so that we can use AI to analyze that. That's also just scratching the surface about nutrition. Yeah, I think the, you know, I, I really applaud the the All of Us program that you probably know that there's a small segment of the million person cohort that they're doing the you know, high resolution mass spec and actually doing metabolic profiling uh, specifically for this purpose of kind of precision nutrition. Right. So you're not relying just on what people tell you that they ate. Yeah. yeah. It may not be accurate. Uh, you're actually looking at the metabolic profile as a way of, of, uh, objectively assessing you know, what actually made it in the system and then also factoring in individual biological variability. I mean, you have the people who could, you know, could be eating you know, Western McDonald's diets and stay rail thin for their entire life. So it's, uh, it, it's good. I mean, I think we're finally beginning to really embrace that we can do something about this. Yeah, I do think as you're getting at the metabolomic layer of data uh, will be more helpful than, uh, you know, it's been difficult to get at that because of some of the expense to do it at scale, to do it properly. But uh, ultimately, that may give us a lot of important insights. Well, along those lines, Eric, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, with ARPA-H kind of coming on the scene now, uh, I know that at least, um, you know, Renee Wagerson is the director of RPH, you know, is very interested in, in uh, are there new technologies uh, that we can actually imagine where we can start capturing some of the high resolution mass spectrometry, but be doing it on a scale that we need to do and with an affordability that needs to happen. I mean, we've seen this in the genomics community. I mean, some of the primitive technologies we started off with, you know, those two color microarrays, you know, spotting cDNAs on microscope slides. You know, it's, it's, it was a start, um, but, you know, it, it's, you know, where we are now, we focused on those technology developments. What are the things we actually need to, need to get done? And so we can do the same thing in environmental health sciences. Yeah, I mean, a, a really recent and uh, I think notable example is the wastewater surveillance. Um, we didn't do that. And here now we can look at you know every pathogen, whether it's SARS-CoV-2 or polio or MPOX or and the whole list. Yep. Now you know we've never done that. We were a, a, a terror on the ranking list of the world. We were you know at the bottom of the uh, rich countries for doing it. And so we've learned how important this is. Uh, and that's just one example of how you know it took a pandemic to figure this out, right? Yeah. Well, I'm pretty familiar with a lot of those, uh, the wastewater experiments, since I'm actually part of my evenings and weekends I spent on the RADx project, and Lucila know, knows that well. Managing all that data is important. But it's interesting, some of those, uh, some of those, those uh, uh, you know, digital PCR strategies that are being used as part of the wastewater, they actually, they, they came out of DARPA projects. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, so that's why I'm, I'm thinking it's, uh, you know, we also talked about frameworks, people approaches. You know, we we need more collaborations, so people developing you know new technologies, you know, know what to develop. You know, the engineers mm -hmm. so that they have a a really a solid framework of what do the physicians and biomedical scientists what do, what do they actually need, rather than having you know technologists and engineers building the things that they think we need, which may may or may not overlap with where the actual needs arise. Sure. Yeah, and I ha I hate to interrupt such such a great conversation. I I think we're out of time, but I, I I love to see how positive both of you are of what is coming up and, and what impact all this will will have in health. Um, so my uh, function is to thank you both for for taking the time to to oh. speak to the the, the panel here and uh, to uh, pass the baton to the organizing committee uh, with closing remarks. So thanks, thanks very much. Support. Thank, Thank you. Take care. I'm here. Bye-bye now. Yeah, bye. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, 
for leading that session and, and for Dr. Wojciech and Dr. Topol for, for really, I think, ending us on a very positive note. So um, thank you to everyone who's joined us all day and who's stayed with us for this really compelling discussion. I'm Carmen Marsit from Emory University, and I've had the great pleasure with a group of some hardworking colleagues and National Academy staff of developing the program for this workshop. I'm going to take a little time now to try and summarize some of the themes that we've heard across this tremendous lineup of speakers and panelists. So we started the day um, in a first session that was really designed as, as what we described as a level setting opportunity to bring everyone to the table to understand the foundations and challenges of bringing AI to environmental data to address health questions by talking about the current state of that environmental data, AI methods, and their application to biomedical research. We started with Dr. Bricey, who highlighted some of the biggest opportunities and challenges in, in, in environmental data. In particular, he noted the explosion of data with increased temporal and spatial resolution and opportunities to think about how data that is being collected for one purpose could be repurposed to consider the health-related consequences, with examples including noise, water, heat, satellite data, and traffic. In addition, he also highlighted opportunities that are developing because of the growth in personal measurements. And, and we had that highlighted a few weeks ago in another one of these workshops. And this is really allowing for a movement more towards the concept of what we talk about as precision environmental health. There are of course challenges that come with those opportunities, integrating this data, making use of the data to predict risk and prioritize efforts, and being sure to assess the effectiveness of this kind of data. He also highlighted the importance of training researchers in our public health workforce to use this kind of data moving forward. Dr. Ono Machado talked about opportunities to use data and AI to mitigate inequities in healthcare by developing new algorithms and tools in informatics and data science to bring together individual health data, like clinical data from, from electronic health records with biological data like genetics or genomics or microbiome. To build predictive models, she, she highlighted, really requires large data repositories to train the models. And this needs to be done really moving toward a more global effort and with privacy protections. She highlighted the NIH All of Us program, which is enrolling a cohort of diverse individuals who are actively giving permission to share their health data. And it is growing its body of environmental health data as well. She also highlighted work considering genetic risks in admixed populations and the need to be able to begin to include other types of data, such as social determinants and environmental data in building risk models. Um, and to do this in diverse populations so that, as she said, no one is left out. Dr. Gassemi reminded us that our goal should be about identifying actionable insights in human health with the ultimate goal of identifying models that can better perform than humans in making decisions about a person's health. At the same time, she noted that AI learns from humans, and so there are biases that are being introduced. Given known biases in existing biomedical and clinical research and implicit biases that are in the clinical landscape. To help address these shortcomings, Dr. Gassemi talked about the need to consider the effectiveness of these models across different groups of people, to see if the models are being developed perform equitably across different types of individuals, um, including those at different intersections. She also noted the importance of building in fairness constraints to try and avoid inclusion of these biases and to learn from other regulatory agencies how best to regulate the use of AI tools. In the second session, we dove into more concrete examples and use cases of how AI and machine learning have been used to bring together environmental health data with biomedical data to address important health questions. The session started with Dr. Patel, who noted a number of large cohort resources that are starting to do these types of data integration. This includes examples like using metabolomic data of diet to understand internal exposomes and predict outcomes, poly exposure risk scores, which bring together multiple layers of exposure data, um, and, cons and considers those along with polygenic risk scores and novel measures of aging based on MRI phenotyping. Given that there are all these new possibilities to integrate multimodal data, there are needs to think about the ways the models are developed to ensure that what we're doing is really robust. Dr. Zhang focused on how to bring various modalities of biological data from often large multi-omic data sets together. One of the biggest challenges that we see when doing this is that there's often missing data, missing modalities, and that was traditionally addressed with imputation. Uh, with AI, he introduced different approaches that could be used by looking at similarities between individuals and using different, different methods to improve the models and, and address the missing data problems. These methods may be more powerful as they don't need prior knowledge and they may produce less bias in their results. 
And then Dr. Hansen brought up the promise of being able to follow an individual throughout their life to be able to provide early identification of risks so that intervention and treatment can happen. And then to continue to monitor those individuals to understand how the environment can inter be impacting their treatment as well. Importantly, this needs to happen in a scalable framework so this can be done at a population level. She noted that to address this challenge requires interdisciplinary team science and used as an example a collaboration between her group at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the SEER program at the National Cancer Institute, where they've developed machine learning models to auto-code information on tumors from pathology reports with built-in accuracy checks and have developed methods to integrate information pulled from residential address histories to build external exposomes. The goal of this is to build foundational models from such data streams that could then provide flexibility to address various downstream questions. And those foundational models is something we've heard uh, as a theme across a lot of what was talked about today. She also emphasized that work to be done in open, that the work needs to be done in an open science framework to assure reproducibility, replicability, and usability for real world data applications. And also to assure appropriate protections for individual privacy. In session three, we focus on new methods that can be used to aid in data integration. The session started with Dr. Ho, who motivated her work based on health equity. As example data streams, she suggested using common social media, app maps, mobility data, and community-based forums to aid in developing potentially different measures of social determinants of health on shorter timescales that could then be related to health measures. This could allow for more fine-grained examinations of information about neighborhoods and their characteristics particularly if you bring in human domain knowledge to guide refinements. The challenge there is that these types of data streams are messy, but that new models need to be trained using this type of real world messy data. Dr. Hartung pointed out the convergence that is bringing us really here today, the huge increase in data, increase in computing power, and the development of new AI methods. He particularly highlighted the growing importance of foundation models, which underlies GPT, that can be applied to a variety of tasks. He called for rethinking and advancing regulatory toxicology and the need to have a human exposome project that incorporates new technology to drive this new toxicology with an implicit incorporation of AI to help in extracting data from the literature and synthesizing that information to inform policy. He highlighted a number of exi existing tools to demonstrate the growing potential for this approach, including the utility of AI tools to replace expensive and time-consuming animal testing protocols for various endpoints. He challenged us to all think about how we can take advantage of this new science and be ready to leave behind old ways of thinking. These presentations led to a discussion on public trust and privacy. The speaker suggested that trust may be, may be supported by continued reliance and understanding of evidence-based solutions and the use of approaches like explanatory AI, which describes how these tools are getting to their answer. There may also be a need to rethink what privacy is and how willing people are to share their information, particularly if they understand what the potential importance could be. There was also some discussion of thinking about the questions being asked, the ability of the data to have an answer, the ethical guardrails, and the continued incorporation of human thought when applying these tools and utilizing their outputs. Finally, in our last session, we welcome Dr. Rick Wojcik, Director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and our keynote speaker, Dr. Eric Topol. Dr. Wojcik set the stage about the incredible wealth of data that is now available to help to understand the environment's impacts on human health and the real potential we have to bring this data together using new AI-based approaches. He highlighted the importance of collaboration and how he is strongly supportive of identifying synergies between NIEHS and its researchers with researchers across the NIH. Dr. Topol talked about potential for AI to help improve diagnostic errors. He provided a number of examples where machine eyes based on unimodal AI have already been successful at identifying information about patients and their diagnoses beyond what efficient, a physician would be able to see. Now we're moving into multimodal approaches, which can take the exposome with multiple biological layers to improve medicine. And he showed examples of how integrating various layers can improve the performance of diagnostic testing and potentially more importantly, prevent errors. He also cautioned, cautioned on challenges including bias, which we heard a number of times today, carbon emissions based on the computing needs, and the need for validation and ut of utility and safety of these models. He ended that he is most excited that there's an opportunity to bring humanity back to medicine by using some of these approaches. I wanted to thank all of you for joining us today. 
And then we hope that you'll join us tomorrow, starting at 10 a.m., where we'll talk about governance and infrastructure for AI, technologies and tools to advance environmental health and biomedical research, and provide an opportunity for everyone to get involved in the conversation. See you then.